Good morning, folks. Uh, I'm Michael McGinnis of the National Academy of Medicine, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to uh, this uh, virtual meeting of the Digital Health Action Collaborative of the National Academy of Medicine. The Digital Health Action Collaborative is a, a key part of our uh, NAM Leadership Consortium, uh, which is comprised of leaders from multiple sectors across uh, the nation leading uh, health and healthcare progress. Uh, the focus of today's meeting uh, is on the tools at our disposal, and that's the uh, tools that are leveraging digital health uh, to combat COVID-19. Uh, if we look at the experience of the last several months in addressing the challenge of COVID-19, uh, one thing has been especially clear, and that is the fundamental importance of our digital health infrastructure in ensuring both the identification of problems, uh, the clarification of the nature of the problems, uh, and the rallying of the, response, uh, of the response on multiple dimensions. Uh, so the uh, issues that we'll be discussing in today's meeting uh, are of vital importance uh, today, uh, tomorrow, and for the future as far as the eye can see. I want to begin with a special note of thanks uh, to uh, our uh, two co-chairs of the collaborative, uh, Jonathan Perlin uh, and Reed Tuxen. Uh, Jonathan uh, and uh, Reed have been with the, the NAM Leadership Consortium uh, since its inception uh, and have provided fundamental leadership uh, to us uh, across the board, uh, and especially, of course, given their co-chair of the Digital Health Action Collaborative in, in uh, the arena of our efforts to catalyze progress uh, in the digital health uh, arena. Uh, you'll, uh, I'll turn the meeting over to them in just a, uh, a second, uh, or maybe just a couple of minutes, I should say. Um, but first, I want to give uh, also a special note of thanks uh, to all of you for tuning in. Uh, many of you are centrally involved in the work of the Digital Health Action Collaborative, uh, but it's important to emphasize that this collaborative is a collaborative without walls. It's a collaborative which aims to provide uh, catalytic uh, uh, progress, uh, to catalyze progress among organizations across the nation uh, working toward the common aim uh, of improving the efficiency, effectiveness, and equity uh, of our health and healthcare systems. The overarching uh, approach of the, uh, of the leadership consortium and its component collaboratives uh, has been to advance the learning health system. A learning health system is defined by the consortium as one in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement, innovation, and equity uh, with best practices seamlessly embedded in the delivery process. Individuals and families, active participants in all elements, and new knowledge generated as an integral byproduct of the delivery experience. Over the course of the last dozen years, uh, the NAM Leadership Consortium uh, has uh, probed extensively into the elements that are necessary in order to move us toward uh, a system that can deliver efficiency, effectiveness, uh, and equity in a continuous learning uh, modality. And we've developed in the course of that time through the work of and leadership of folks like Jonathan uh, and Reed and their colleagues uh, th throughout the Leadership Consortium, about two dozen publications uh, in the Learning Health System series. The important issue, of course, is not the publications, but the way in which they've been developed in a collaborative process, engaging and mobilizing elements of the field in that respect. Uh, through the work of that um, uh, set of, uh, of uh, analytic endeavors uh, and an assessment of the challenges to the nation in health and healthcare, a series of anchor principles have been developed for improving health system performance. 
those anchor principles uh, that in effect define uh, the challenges for every stakeholder uh, in the health and healthcare system uh, is to ensure that activities that they steward are personal, that they're safe, that they're effective, that they're equitable, that they're efficient, that they're accessible, that they're transparent, that they're adaptive, and that they're secure. These may be similar, uh, uh, may be uh, familiar to those of you who've uh, been working uh, over the past decades uh, in health and healthcare leadership because they are similar with some expansion uh, to the uh, work of the Quality Chasm series, which is the, the uh, National Academy of Medicine and previously the Institute of Medicine. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, the uh, Quality Chasm series identified important principles uh, in order to ensure the healthcare system's performance met the needs that, to which it was intended. And the six principles identified in the year 2000 with the Quality Chasm Report uh, and to Eris Human were that care should be patient-centered, safe, effective, equitable, efficient, and timely. So you see that as we broadened our focus beyond just the healthcare system, and as we worked to ensure that we were taking advantage of the latest developments uh, in the digital arena uh, and the appreciation of the dynamics that were fundamentally important in order to ensure that patients and families had the kind of tools in their uh, control that allowed them to be more active performers uh, uh, in the system. A few elements were added. The tr importance of transparency, of adaptivity with, through continuous learning and improvement, and security, uh, something that we all see on a daily basis uh, in our digital lives. The overall uh, focus then of the work of the Leadership Consortium has been on collaborative action. And the collaborative action has been stewarded uh, through four uh, action collaboratives. Uh, the Digital Health uh, Action Collaborative is, has stewarded the focus on informatics. We have three other action collaboratives, the Evidence Mobilization Action Collaborative focused on science. Uh, with incentives, it's the Value Incentives and Systems Action Collaborative. And with culture, it's the Culture, Inclusion, and Equity Action Collaborative. As you can see, instinctively, these are overlapping uh, collaboratives. Uh, for example, uh, the advances in science and evidence mobilization are fundamentally important upon the advances in digital health. So the work of each of the collaboratives is carefully uh, coordinated and synchronized uh, among uh, uh, each other. Next slide, please. The way in which we work is through um, a series of stakeholder leaders uh, in public and private and independent organizations uh, from the key health sectors, uh, using the good offices of the NAM uh, to forward the collaborative endeavor. Uh, and uh, with common commitments to advancing effectiveness, efficiency, and equity uh, in health, medical care, and biomedical science. So it's the notion of these are stakeholder leaders throughout the nation uh, from multiple sectors working together. Uh, the COVID-19 challenge, next slide please, uh, has brought about uh, a perfect storm, if you will, uh, and I won't go through the elements that we all know, the, uh, the novelty of the virus and the challenges to the health system and the fragmented supply lines and so forth. Um, but it has, in effect, served as a crucible uh, for the problems uh, that confront many of our, each of our sectors in different ways. The common lesson, uh, as we've begun to try to get, uh, understand what's uh, happened that we can use as actionable motivations uh, for changing the system, 
uh, essentially are, are, are two for the purposes of today's discussion. First, that science, informatics, incentives, and culture matter. As we see, uh, the, uh, the, the, the most dramatic uh, fit, uh, challenges and in, in, in some ways, in some cases, failures with uh, uh, the need to act quickly and to ensure that all elements of society are engaged, these are dimensions that we need to bear down on uh, as we move to transform our health system uh, to accomplish what it can. The second uh, issue is that their alignment matters even more. That is, one of our biggest problems as a system has been the fragmentation. Uh, uh, and it's vitally important uh, that we work in a fashion that ensures that the alignment activities within each of those broad domains uh, are working on behalf of the nation's uh, health and health care. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we have done in that respect then uh, is um, in, uh, undertaken uh, under the auspices of the Leadership Consortium uh, efforts to align science, informatics, incentives, and culture by doing sector assessments. Uh, we have um, leaders from around the nation, including uh, the individuals who are with us today, uh, looking at how COVID-19 has impacted the uh, various sectors uh, that are represented on the Leadership Consortium. Uh, and uh, in doing that, identify sector and system-wide uh, priorities for transformation. And in particular, taking a close look at the financing structures that are so vital uh, to rewarding effectiveness, efficiency, and equity in health. Um, uh, we won't go into the challenges of our fee-for-service system, but it's very clear uh, that um, a, a common denominator in moving for progress uh, uh, resides in our being able to reward financially the kind of uh, progress that we all need. Last slide, please, for me. Next slide. Okay. Um, so the sector impact assessments that we have underway uh, are the nine I mentioned are focused um, on these sectors, patients, families, and communities, clinicians and professional societies, care delivery organizations, digital health stakeholders, state and local public health, healthcare payers, health product manufacturers and innovators, health and biomedical research, quality, safety, and standards organizations. Each of these nine sectors is, uh, uh, has a, a series of uh, stakeholders who are very prominent leaders uh, throughout the nation and indeed in, in some cases throughout the world, um, undertaking an assessment of the challenges that have been confronted, of the solutions that are needed to uh, uh, improve progress on those challenges, and most importantly, looking across the health system as a whole for health system transformation that will allow us to be much better prepared uh, for similar challenges in the future. Uh, so uh, that's the big broad uh, picture and context uh, for uh, what is the nerve center uh, for progress, the digital health arena. Uh, and uh, again, with a very special uh, underscoring of our gratitude uh, for their leadership, I'd like to turn uh, the program over to our co-chairs, Reed Tuxton and John Perlin, with deep thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. We really appreciate that. And if we could have the next slide, uh, we want to start to give you a sense of the agenda. But let me just say uh, a, a quick word of introduction for myself. Um, I am particularly excited uh, by this, uh, this agenda today. Uh, I have been privileged to lead uh, a grassroots effort in Washington, D.C. Uh, in fighting uh, the COVID pandemic uh, with the communities, particularly the lowest socioeconomic uh, communities in the district for the last six months now. Uh, we have confronted these issues uh, square in the face. And I am particularly interested today in our lessons learned, the use cases that we will have, 
And also, given what Michael has indicated, there is a bias towards action here. What can the National Academy of Medicine do to solve some of the barriers which will be discussed, social, uh, cultural, uh, organizational, economical, technical, um, so many challenges that we will need to overcome to move forward to make the most use out of these tools uh, in applying them to serious challenges that are so unequally born uh, by people uh, who are socioeconomically uh, challenged. So this is a very, very important conversation today. Um, Jonathan will, in just a moment, uh, lead us through a strategic framing of the issues. Uh, we are very pleased that Tom Frieden is here uh, to give us an overview from his unique perspective of overview of testing in the United States. Aletha Maybank will talk to us about digital tools for treatment and monitoring, uh, which will be key next. Um, Ted Long from New York City Health and Hospitals will uh, help us go through New York City as a case study. Uh, there will be a panel discussion uh, among all of them. And then finally, we will conclude with this very important summary of next steps. And I cannot emphasize enough, uh, Jonathan and I in particular urge you strongly to be very specific uh, when we get to the end about your recommendations for how the National Academy uh, can go forward. And one last slide for me, and I want to make sure that we emphasize how you uh, can participate, um, that um, we obviously want people to keep their phone lines muted, um, uh, and, and that's important. Uh, turn on your video if you can, um, uh, because we are recording it. Uh, and for our attendees, please uh, remember to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A located at the bottom of the screen of your Zoom interface. And we really do want to hear from you. And with that, let me turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Jonathan Perlin, to uh, give us the, the strategic framing. Well, good morning, everybody. And thanks so much, um, Reid uh, and, and Michael. Uh, not only for your kind introduction, but uh, even more for your uh, terrific leadership uh, and the inspiring work. Uh, and to all the participants who are with us today, uh, as Reid said, we have a pension for action. Uh, and uh, NAM has a unique convening capacity. Uh, and um, uh, we have a moment uh, where action uh, is required. And so your participation, your input uh, is uh, exceptionally valued. We wouldn't be here absent the NAM staff. And uh, let me just at the outset offer my thanks to, uh, to, to the staff who've made this possible. Uh, as I reflect on um, uh, Michael McGinnis's and, um, and Reed Tuxen's uh, comments, I, I, I do so from the, the privilege uh, of um, uh, being part of a large organization that to date has cared for more than 60,000 COVID positive inpatients, more than 150,000 COVID positive outpatients, done well over a million and a half tests. Uh, and it's provided uh, a catbird seat to um, uh, what's working uh, and what's not, uh, what's present and what's not in terms of a learning health system, what's present and what's not in terms of population health what's present and what's not in terms of the ability to engage directly with patients uh, through data, even with remarkable adaptations in the use of telehealth and the like, but the absence of an infrastructure that brings together healthcare and public health. Uh, and it's in that vein that I'm so tremendously excited about um, uh, the conversation and uh, the next slide, uh, appreciative of um, uh, everyone's input. Uh, into um, uh, the overarching goal, which is really building robust digital health infrastructure uh, in support uh, of the principles that Michael McGinnis outlined that are, are part and parcel of a learning health system. You know, at, at its core, a learning health system is one, uh, is really a virtuous cycle, a mechanism through which the data that are an invariable byproduct of not only the formal healthcare environment, but um, increasingly of life itself. Uh, can be uh, coalesced into a connective, collective memory that can be used not only to inform care decisions at the bedside, but care decisions uh, and life decisions um, uh, across the continuum uh, that individuals uh, experience both in their role as patients, but uh, in their day-to-day um, uh, -day roles as members of, um, uh, of, of community. Uh, it's a self-rectifying system. It's one that has not only a collective memory, but the most important and operative word uh, is, is, is learning. Um, the collaborative focus is really on helping to articulate both the mechanisms as well as the values that are expressed as principles um, to create a core utility that allows this collective memory to exist, that allows the ability to inform uh, improvement of, uh, of health uh, and, uh, and, and care. 
Uh, and um, uh, I know Michael likes to describe this sometimes as a digital commons, um, uh, a, a social good, a shared uh, resource that um, uh, can advance uh, health and, and, and care. Uh, and um, that uh, increasingly uh, we've moved not only from the attributes in a mechanistic sense of what would make this work to the attributes uh, as an articulation of value uh, of, of, of stewardship of this potential uh, but ultimately precious resource that um, would create that digital infrastructure for uh, learning. I want to uh, personally uh, commend um, uh, Michael McGinnis, um, uh, Victor Zell, the National Academies uh, for so much of the work that um, their efforts have spawned, um, including a number of the titles uh, and activities of uh, not only books, but uh, important meetings, convening activities that have set direction in, in terms of digital health and a learning health system, the title itself of uh, international collaboration, uh, a, a work in progress on a digitally enabled health future. Um, um, and I think um, uh, incredibly important work in AI for care delivery uh, with the uh, Government Accountability Office, as well as um, um, uh, work on health equity, AI, and algorithmic integrity. Uh, I, I think we've seen um, uh, challenges where um, deficiencies in, in care get codified um, through uh, algorithms uh, in a way that perpetuates rather than ameliorates uh, disparity uh, and um, uh, mechanisms for uh, achieving uh, more equitable, effective uh, outcomes. Uh, and um, there's a volume that I'd particularly call to your attention that grew out of this group on artificial intelligence and machine learning in uh, health and healthcare that um, uh, really, uh, its full title is the, the hype, the hope, um, the promise, the peril. Uh, and I think it uh, really um, uh, is, is worth um, a, a look in terms of, um, uh, of, of those attributes uh, and um, envisioning a future. Uh, and, and finally, um, a set of dashboard metrics that um, will keep ourselves accountable to, um, uh, to, to progress. Uh, knowing is not enough, we must do, as is the watchword of both the Collaborative uh, and the National Academies. Uh, and we need to translate to action. Uh, and uh, you'll hear a little bit more momentarily about um, uh, metrics on individuals having access to their uh, health data uh, and that care uh, is seamlessly connected uh, and integrated. Uh, and the decision support uh, is, is available. Um, I think we need to challenge our field further and uh, COVID as Michael McGlynis alluded to provides that lens to make we catalyze not only the improvements in these domains, but uh, overtly to population health, community health, public health. Uh, and uh, as uh, I think we all realize COVID has provided that lens uh, of what's working and what's not, but what tools are present uh, and are and what's not, even in terms of um, supply chain and um, uh, basic um, preparedness. Uh, and um, our work today will help us refine further what the attributes are uh, in terms of um, uh, what, what's necessary uh, and otherwise. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a complex diagram and kudos to um, uh, the National Academy staff for really thinking through uh, what are requirements um, uh, and what efforts must converge around um, uh, a mechanism that will promote and um, perpetuate trust uh, in a health data core to create that viable infrastructure. Uh, so let's start with the circles um, uh, around that, um, that digital commons, that health data trust. Let's start at 11 o'clock with the foundational requirements. Uh, cybersecurity is um, uh, absolutely um, uh, essential. Uh, and um, I think the recent Ryuk um, ransomware uh, event really drove home uh, how both dependent we are on information technology today and how um, uh, in insufficient we are in terms of the mechanisms for um, uh, full security in a world uh, where uh, we have to recognize um, uh, state-sponsored um, large actor um, uh, terrorist threats as um, not only um, uh, international um, uh, violence, but uh, frankly threats to the public um, uh, health. Um, along those lines at a more personal level at one o'clock is identity protection. Uh, and um, uh, at two o'clock, um, making sure that the data retain integrity uh, and, um, uh, and, and reliability uh, and that provenance uh, is, is known. If we move down to four o'clock and the process requirements, then we need to have uh, mechanisms for coding crosswalks. The concept really behind that is semantic interoperability, where a concept is conserved across settings, where sodium in California means the same thing as NA plus uh, in Nashville uh, at Tennessee. Uh, and that the representations um, uh, allow all to access the, the concept uh, consistently. 
at five o'clock uh, is the uh, sort of technical architecture for digital uh, interoperability. At seven o'clock, uh, the mechanisms for data access and transfer. Imagine a network of uh, ATMs um, uh, that existed, but you couldn't withdraw cash or, or make a deposit. We need to have the technical backbone to allow uh, the other higher order activities to occur. At eight o'clock is, um, is data curation and analytics. We talked uh, a moment ago about uh, AI and uh, machine learning. Uh, but also, we can't represent, or it's probably inefficient to represent everything. Uh, you don't want my whole genome. You want to know um, uh, what genes of, are of particular interest. But um, you have to retain the entire product because um, with learning, understanding um, uh, changes uh, over time. So work in that domain uh, needs uh, to occur. At 10 o'clock, how are um, uh, data released? Um, what are the conditions for that? Uh, and then um, um, some of the big principles, um, at 9 o'clock, you see uh, AI and ML, and um, as, as mentioned, National Academies have a working group um, on, on that area. Uh, and 3 o'clock, um, this concept on uh, ownership of data may be um, falling um, to the wayside a little bit to this concept of uh, a person's agency. Uh, over their data, and I uh, really want to commend uh, great work. And you look back in the records of this body, I, I think you'll find some terrific insights into um, uh, how patients, how individuals, how consumers, uh, how groups of individuals might assert agency in the use of, um, uh, of data. Uh, and then at the top, as I mentioned, uh, need to keep ourselves accountable with core indicators that help us mark and, um, and measure uh, progress uh, as we moved uh, forward. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll move not only to the core principles, um, which are really a set of articulated values, but some candidate indicators. Uh, and um, uh, indeed, um, Michael covered um, uh, these with respect to an evolution from uh, the steep, as some of us call it, framework uh, introduced with the quality chasm to an application, uh, a broad index application, I think a more mature uh, and um, uh, socially aware uh, representation of attributes or principles uh, for the stewardship of, of, um, uh, of data and the creation of this digital commons and the underpinnings of a learning health system. Uh, and so I, I, I won't reiterate, but just contextualize that um, just as these attributes uh, would apply to a set of articulated values that we'd um, want uh, to, to exist for health uh, and, and care broadly, um, there are mechanisms to apply them specifically to their use uh, in terms of uh, data. And finally, on the next slide, uh, let me move to a set of candidate measures. And um, at this juncture, think of them as more um, a directional, and we'd certainly value your input into how to operationalize. But you get the general sense of the um, uh, areas where we need to uh, mark and measure progress and hold ourselves accountable. The availability of ind industry-wide health data stewardship standards, including consent transparency, equity, privacy, security, and public reporting of performance relative to the standards uh, for all parties who handle health data, regardless of regulatory requirements. Uh, this is an ability of us to, to actually lead the, the regulatory process uh, rather than be uh, either circumscribed uh, or inadvertently constrained, but rather to articulate an expression of values into tractable uh, standards that an industry agrees to. Second, the degree to which synthesized relevant and actionable information are available to and used by clinicians and individuals to support care decisions. Uh, and third, the degree to which individually generated health data is integrated into the learning health system. Really a reflection that COVID, um, uh, again, sharpens the lens to realize that care doesn't begin and end with the doors of the formal healthcare setting, but um, health is a part of life uh, and the decisions that inform health um, need to be garnered uh, from the person. Uh, in the course of um, uh, their membership of, in, in community uh, and in population uh, more broadly. Uh, and, and finally, the, the fact that um, uh, we are driven by science, uh, that we value um, uh, evidence, uh, and that um, we measure the percentage of um, uh, digital health tool use that in fact is supported uh, and driven uh, by evidence. Uh, so these are, these are starting points, as I say, directionally correct. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, we'll be tested both by the conversation uh, we have today, uh, but um, uh, as I uh, turn back to, to, to read uh, and uh, look forward to this really important um, uh, conversation with uh, terrific um, thought leaders like um, Tom Frieden and others, um, a context which uh, shows us uh, that we're doing better than paper, but we haven't realized that digital revolution 
we haven't realized that digital commons that uh, Michael McGinnis uh, in, in envisions. Uh, and uh, we haven't realized the trust, particularly among um, uh, more vulnerable populations uh, that um, uh, would be ne necessary in a more perfect world uh, that would allow um, uh, things like contact tracing uh, and, um, uh, and um, uh, better public health population health measures uh, to uh, occur uh, as, as part of a system we know uh, rather than one that we envision. So here's our opportunity to move um, uh, from uh, a vision to action uh, and uh, look forward to the conversation that provides guidance uh, in that direction. Thanks so much. Um, back to you, Ray. Thanks so much, Jonathan, for an excellent strategic framing and also that last call to action. We are very pleased now to look at the, an overview of testing in the United States uh, where we really want to understand an assessment of the digital tools being employed in testing efforts uh, across various communities in the United States. And here reactors give us their response on the strengths and limitations of these tools with respect to their efficacy, their access, and their uptake. Who better to start us off than uh, Tom uh, Frieden? We all know him, uh, but let's make sure we know him now in the context of his leadership role at Resolve to Save Lives, an initiative of vital strategy. Tom, take it away. Thank you so much, Reed. It's great to see you again. Great to be in a meeting with you, even if virtually. Uh, Michael, John, great to see you. If we can have the slides, I'll take us through uh, quickly. Uh, I wanted to go a little beyond testing to talk more broadly about testing and tracing and make one fundamental point, which is that digital tools can enhance but not replace traditional public health interventions. Next slide, please. Uh, the boxed in approach is fundamental for epidemic control. I would say test strategically, isolate promptly, contact trace completely, and quarantine supportively. These are the four corners of that box. And if you do those four things, you can get COVID in a box so we can get out into more of society. One of the things that's been so painful to see is the persistent failure in the US to implement this strategy uh, well in most of the country, including right now in one particular residence. Next, please. Comprehensive test and trace strategies are key to controlling the virus. Uh, again, digital tools can supplement but not supplant traditional test and trace processes. And I wish we had never called it contact tracing. Perhaps COVID care coordination, COVID services, services to support patients, services to, to warn contacts. Um, exposure notification tools have been a distraction. Uh, Bluetooth is going to be better than GPS, but these have overpromised, underdelivered, muddied the waters, and distracted public health people. Now, there are now a handful of states trying these. I downloaded one myself uh, for New York, but uh, they should definitely be tried. They should definitely be evaluated. They may have useful roles. They're not likely to be particularly important. Uh, and for those of you who are not uh, into this debate in detail, the exposure notification is the idea that you're gonna put an app on your phone or have some enabled um, aspect of your mobile phone that will tell you if you've been within six feet for more than 15 minutes of somebody else who then has COVID and you would get notified right away. Um, it reminds me of the Yogi Berra line, in theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they're different. Uh, in theory, this is a great way of finding contacts. If you, if you, and you'll see a lot of urban legend about it. Oh, this is what they did in Asia. Absolutely not. In fact, definitively, you talk to the people in Singapore or Taiwan, they say, no, these things didn't really help us. It was all about people talking to people, gaining their trust and working with them. Digital tools likely to be most useful are probably those that provide incremental benefits by making the staff work more effective and that enabling the staff to work more uh, effectively, more efficiently. Next slide, please. Now, there's some really key lessons. Contact tracing is the process of supporting patients and warning people who've been exposed. It works only as part of a strategy that includes strategic testing, 
rapid isolation, and supportive quarantine. If any one corner of that box I showed earlier is weak, the virus is going to escape. And any facility that depends on any one corner, testing, for example, is going to be quite vulnerable to an outbreak. It's a labor and time intensive uh, job. It's a skill that requires training, expertise, empathy, technical knowledge, people skills, detective work, access to resources to help find and support index patients and their contacts, supportive expert supervision, and it hinges on public participation and support. So the public understands why it's being done and what's being done. Next, please. Technology can help. Digital tools can make traditional contact tracing more efficient and effective. Workflow support, call center technology, and I say this with trepidation, contact tracing is not running a call center. But call center technology can make good contact tracing more efficient. Assistance finding contact information for cases and contacts. Those of us in public health have done this for decades. As we try to find TB or STD patients, we put it into various commercial or uh, government databases to see if we can find people. Can that be done more efficiently? Support to help people remember their contacts and locations. Uh, support for contacts to monitor help and get help. These technologies have great potential, but they're not yet widely available. Next, please. Now, here are just a few of the pain points in the current workflow. The index case lab report. Um, through all of these, there are often not enough trained, supervised, skilled people, but lab reports often are incomplete, delayed, non-standard, antigen tests aren't getting reported, um, contact information is, again, incorrect or in incomplete. Even if you reach the, contact, the index case, it takes multiple tries. Many can't be located or don't answer. If the interview is conducted, manual data entry takes a lot of time. There may be incomplete contact elicitation. There are barriers of language, culture, and trust. Contacts are reached, but often there's incomplete information. It takes multiple tries. They can't be contacted. And cluster investigations require highly specialized skills. Contracts are monitored with daily symptom reporting and fielding questions and linking to services. At all of these steps, there's fall off. And for every fall off, there's more spread of COVID. Next, please. Now at Resolve, we're exploring the creation of some digital tools. All of these are open source. All of them are free. Uh, we look at the various steps in the process from laboratory reporting to index case queue uh, to case investigation, to monitoring, contact interviews, and uh, completion. Um, next, please. Um, we have several different tools that we're looking at in the digital space. One of them uh, we've called uh, Epi Viaduct. This is currently in production in both New York and New Jersey. Uh, a second is called Epi Contact to help uh, cases identify their contacts. A third is called EpiLocator, which is live in New York and will be piloted in New Jersey in this month. And the fourth, which is currently on hold, is Stay Home, uh, supporting people who are on isolation or quarantine. Next, please. This is Viaduct. The idea is that programs would spend less time cleaning COVID lab records um, so that uh, there would be more efficiency and more speed of laboratory data ingestion. Um, the early indicators of performance is that it took from many days to just a few hours to fix missing cases, that uh, the time to fix reported issues uh, went from unable to be tracked to about 20 minutes, that the speed to actually ingest the data went from more than two and a half hours to less than a minute. Next, please. At the locator, um, is also a way of using commercial services or others to enrich the data with more phone numbers. Um, this, uh, we think, will help establish contacts with contact with more than 90% of cases and at least half of elicited contacts and to find missing details within uh, seconds to minutes. Uh, it's being used um, almost immediately, hundreds of times a day when it's hooked, hooked up to uh, 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 services. Next, please. 
Epi Contacts is not currently in use, but we hope to have a series of measures that will help cases remember who their contacts are and voluntarily opt in to share them. Next, please. This is an example of how this might work. Um, essentially, Epi Contacts would work like a tablet that you fill in in the waiting room of the doctor's office so that you're filling in the information before you have the conversation. Um, we've not yet piloted this, but we think it's promising. Next, please. There are lots of challenges to technology implementation. There is enormous heterogeneity and lack of standardization in our healthcare, laboratory, and public health systems, and a lack of interoperability among, within and among those three different worlds. Sustainability, and this is going to be an issue with some of the commercial products that are being widely spread now, uh, cost, interoperability, adopting new technologies for their own sake, not because they solve a problem. What we see as a motif is that people have a system that can work very well, they're very invested in it, it's very hard to think of building, going into a new system, and the, the uh, landscape of, uh, public health informatics is littered with rusting hulks of failed systems. And frankly, the landscape of electronic health records is littered with tens of billions of dollars spent and very little health value added. Uh, we've failed to design for the end user. We failed to gain staff buy-in and we've failed to ensure adequate training and rapid response to problems. We're not properly monitoring, analyzing, or using the data that's being collected. Next, please. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are essential to every aspect of our response. Uh, some areas that require particular focus are that new technologies and adequate bandwidth and hardware are less likely to be available to low-income communities, rural communities, and communities of color. More must be done to ensure access to beneficial technology advances. Disproportionate access requires disproportionate response. And broadband internet is an essential service. It should be freely available to all. One in three kids, primarily from low-income communities, rural and communities of color, ha have, do not have the broadband access needed for school. School closures are greatly exacerbating the inequalities in our society. Broadband access would also really benefit isolated cases and quarantine contacts. Next, please. Final slide is what we need now. We need a focus on public health. Places around the country and around the world that are guided by and fully support public health have less disease, less death, and less economic devastation. Digital tools can enhance existing testing and contact tracing programs, but not replace them. An open source technology platform with full interoperability and ease of use uh, would be a major step forward, but faces enormous barriers because of both um, the limitations of public health systems and because of the commercial forces in opposition to this. Proper staff training and supervision and ensuring that all communities can benefit from technology enhancements. Uh, next slide, I'll just end with one last thought and you can turn the slides off, which is that um, COVID control can work if we ensure that the patient and the contact uh, are the VIPs of the system. They need to have the services uh, that will allow them to be successful in protecting themselves and their families. This is not a, a, a rote service. This is uh, an in-depth care management service. And to the extent that digital tools can help that, great. Uh, but it's going to require public health expertise. It's going to require, as uh, Reed and others mentioned, intense community engagement. And it's going to require a feedback loop so we know what's working and what's not so that we can expand what's working and stop doing what's not working. So thanks very much. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be with you, at least for the next uh, uh, few minutes. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tom. Uh, we're going to take some quick reactions and then open it up to Q&A, if that's okay with you.
Uh, will you be able to stay on for the reaction, uh, Tom? Yes, I'll, I'll stay on. Great, thank you. Jay Butler, uh, known to all of us uh, from the uh, CDC. And Jay, why don't we start right off with your reflections, please? Great, thank you, Reed, and good morning, everyone. It really is an honor to be here today. It's always a little intimidating to, to follow a Tom Frieden presentation, but I, I have to start by saying thank you, Tom, for uh, not only an inspirational presentation, but for the work you continue to do uh, with Resolve to Save Lives. Uh, Dr. McGinnis uh, talked about the COVID pandemic is uh, a perfect storm. And I was thinking about that analogy. And it brought to mind a speaker I heard in the media probably about February, who predicted that the pandemic would be a great equalizer and because we're all in the same boat. And I actually think the perfect storm is a much better analogy uh, because we're not all in the same boat. We are out in rough seas right now, but are, we're in very different boats. Some of us are in yachts, some of us are in uh, canoes or leaky dinghies, uh, some of us are in the water, uh, maybe even without uh, a life jacket. And that's reflected in the health inequities that we're seeing uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has shown a bright light on the longstanding health inequities in, in our, our nation. And uh, it's, uh, we, we shouldn't be uh, surprised by that. Uh, we should be angered. We should uh, be inspired to uh, do something about it. Uh, as was said earlier, knowing is not enough. Um, in the, uh, the, the COVID response at CDC, uh, one of the things that we incorporated into the response was uh, actually a, a chief health equity officer who could help make sure that all of what we are doing might have that focus on addressing the health inequities that the pandemic has highlighted, both in the response to the pandemic and in planning strategies for public health approaches in the, the future. Uh, we recognize there's no magic bullets, but it's going to take a, a layered approach both to address uh, COVID-19 and also to address the, the health inequities that have been longstanding. Uh, one of the, the things that I, I want to uh, highlight uh, in, in following up on uh, what Tom was describing and the role of the digital tools, um, we, we do tend to be attracted to the latest shiny object and uh, the, the urban legends are, are not data. Uh, so we, we want to know what's uh, going to be the, the breaking technology, what's going to be the magic bullet to, to solve our, our problems. And so I'd, I'd actually like to pull us away from that to uh, something that is not so new, but the role of telehealth in addressing uh, COVID-19, as well as addressing health disparities. When we talk about the disparities across the nation, uh, it's more than uh, racial inequities, ethnic inequities, socioeconomic status. It's also uh, a rural urban divide issue and recognizing that within urban environments, there's quite a bit of inequity as well. Uh, but I have to uh, lean a bit on my personal experience, uh, having uh, been in the Alaska Native Tribal Health System for a number of years, uh, overseeing the clinical programs in HIV and viral hepatitis and seeing how uh, telehealth has the potential to really address some of these issues that are involved in providing comprehensive uh, COVID care coordination, whether that be in providing healthcare services or providing follow-up uh, for someone who is exposed or uh, perhaps is asymptomatic and is found to have a positive test. Number of advantages of a, a telehealth approach. One is it's much more convenient uh, we know that uh, it's challenging to get out and be able to uh, get a test or to be uh, evaluated even if you get sick, particularly if uh, you don't have uh, easy transportation. Uh, right now, uh, still in many areas, mass transit is somewhat disrupted or not on the, the usual schedules. Uh, it also provides an opportunity for greater utilization of community health workers and moves the services much closer to where people live. Uh, in the tribal uh, health system in Alaska, uh, the community health aid is the frontline provider. They work under the uh, 
uh, supervision of either a physician or an advanced practice registered nurse. And there's actually telehealth carts so that uh, they can use things like video otoscope or a video stethoscope. Uh, and these have proven to be uh, emerging tools in evaluating patients with uh, suspected COVID uh, in the response in uh, those rural areas. It also provides the opportunity to maintain social distancing, uh, and that includes not only uh, a, a, an exposure for the patient who may not actually have COVID-19, but also exposure for healthcare providers, and this could potentially spare PPE for more uh, risky situations. It also provides the opportunity to, to tele-triage, and uh, that may be as simple as being able to listen to someone on the phone call, or perhaps such as what we're doing right now, where we can see one another, and you can probably tell whether I look uh, ashen or fit, or if I'm uh, short of breath. Uh, and it uh, also maintains healthcare for non-COVID uh, issues. Uh, we know that uh, people with uh, chronic conditions have not received all of the care that they need, mental health care, uh, has also been challenged by social distancing and inability to get to some of those services. And telehealth is beginning to, to fit into that, uh, that void now. And uh, I think we're going to learn quite a bit going forward about the role of uh, not only remote meetings, such as what we're doing right now, but also how healthcare can, can be delivered uh, remotely in a uh, safe, effective, and efficient way. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it back uh, to you, Reed, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. Great, and, and thank you so much, and we appreciate that. And now let's turn to our old and good friend, uh, uh, Linda Ray Murray from the uh, University of Illinois Chicago for her reflections. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And, and I want to thank Dr. Frieden for starting us off with such a thorough overview of the problems we're facing. I want to sort of concentrate on some of perhaps the solutions. I certainly agree with how he's outlined it. Um, and I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from how we rolled out electronic health records and how we've addressed other major issues in terms of using digital tools. Uh, I certainly agree, and I think we have to put this forward from the public health community, and frankly, also the medical community with some strength. We need to view digital tools and access to the broadband as a basic public utility. We need to have the same approach that we did some decades ago when we tried to roll out electricity across the country, especially to our rural communities. Um, I certainly agree that it has to be open source. We have to actually address this notion, are we going to allow specific companies to compete with their uh, uh, proprietary systems and, and bid us up in terms of dollars? We need to say, no, this needs to be interoperable. Uh, it needs to be open source. Uh, it needs to be free. It needs to be viewed as a basic utility, a basic structure for our country. Um, too often in public health, uh, and in government in general, digital tools have been posited to justify layoffs. And as Dr. Frieden said, contact tracing and all of public health that we do, certainly all of healthcare, is a profoundly human activity. And you have to have human beings using these various tools. Sometimes the tools we develop make us more efficient. Sometimes they're a waste of time where they should be evaluated. But I agree with Dr. Frieden, we can't take the human being out of this. I want to remind people that of about the 3,000 county and local health departments in our country, less than a third have an epidemiology on staff. I shudder to think what happens if digital tools become widespread and less than a third have uh, internet security and, and digital security people on staff to protect this critical data that we basically need protected to gain the public trust. So that these problems that we have, the, the divides and the equities that we have, are there for all areas, not just digital. And in order to gain people's trust, we have to really do what Dr. Friedman suggested at the very beginning. We have to show some compassion and decrease the gaps that exist in terms of how we care for patients, how we support people that we ask to be quarantined, how we support people that are actually sick. Um, so until we begin to address those inequities, the digital tools that we have will just reflect the underlying problems that we have in our country. I think that uh, Dr. Frieden's group especially has been very useful during this pandemic to allow people to understand and see how public health processes this, these things. And I think together we have to call for the basic principles that he outlined. 
open source interoperability uh, free for the, at the point of use um, so that we can proceed forward as a field and as a country. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we uh, really appreciate it. Let's, we have about five minutes for Q&A. And so people, please feel free to type in. Meanwhile, could uh, let me ask the first question to Tom. Um, if we could put up that slide that he had on the challenges. And as they do that, Tom, I will just make a comment that um, the work that I'm doing, at least in the inner city of DC, uh, I really do want to talk to you more about the issue of distrust of, of, of technology. That is just a huge issue. And I would urge you to put that on your list of challenges very prominently uh, because the distrust is, is, is a major, major, uh, it's in fact, it was a non-starter. But if we go back to your challenges list and you had a bunch of challenges, I'm curious to see out of all of those, Tom, putting you on the spot a little bit, um, and we don't see the one that I'm looking for, but the, the, he had a series of challenges near the end of his presentation. Out of all of your challenges, uh, uh, Tom, which do you think are the most important? If you had to prioritize, where would you, yeah, where would you take us uh, and where would you guide or ask the National Academy perhaps to be of some help uh, in, 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 in bringing together solutions for these challenges? Uh, that's a great question, Reed. And I, I guess I, I feel like I'll just tell you a little, a brief story. Uh, 27 years, I did digital development in the public sector, and I really felt we were doing it wrong the whole time. And three years now, we've been doing it at uh, Resolve, and I think I was right that we were doing it wrong in the public sector for 27 years. You end up spending a lot of money building something that doesn't work very well. And uh, you do it over and over again. Um, I don't know the right approach because I'm not a technology person, uh, but um, what we've done at Resolve with a product called Simple, uh, which you can see at simple.org, is to develop um, an, a, a mobile phone based tool for health workers. And that tool takes 14 seconds for the nurse to enter uh, the blood pressure, uh, the, the clinical visit, 14, so that's metadata based on hundreds of thousands of patients, uh, based on a team that built this for the end user, that studied everything from how big should the font be to what gets tapped first, so that they optimized it for the nurse who it was intended for. And it gives you pretty much everything you need to manage a system. Um, so I think we have to build for the end user with agile design, we have to have a platform that says, I mean, we have to have a government that's um, forceful enough to say to states, we have to get past that first bullet. Um, you know, everyone has to have a system that meets these criteria. And then says, you may either use your own if you can prove it meets these criteria, or you can move, meet this new one that is built, that's free and open source, and that we will build as a public good. Um, I, I don't know how this happens because we have a mismatch. We have government informatics people who have a great deal of difficulty managing the private sector. We have a private digital um, uh, set of contractors who are really good at fleecing the public sector and have a, a cost, a profit model that is that you know fine if if you're just you're a profit making company. I understand that that's how our economy works. But if we're building something that's going to have to be used for a decade or more by the government and you're going to put up barriers to entry. So we're going to be stuck with your system, which within six months is going to be out of date, even if it's good today. That's not a model that works. So I think um, the, the mindset of agile user-focused design and the money of understanding how we're going to pay for this in a way that makes clear it's a public good. And if companies got to, are going to uh, play they're gonna play on a platform that's open source, public good, free, and they're gonna compete, if you will, with a public option. Because we're going to right. develop a public option for these tools 
uh, that uh, any jurisdiction can use for free and the government will pay for its uh, data transition to there, uh, or you can use your own. And now you've got real uh, a, a competition that's a little bit more fair. We in the government have been bringing a knife to the gunfight of, uh, of dealing with uh, contractors in the digital space, and we need to change that dynamic. Tom, thank you so much. And we're um, hard up against the, uh, the time to stop, but let me just mention two things from the audience. Uh, number one, uh, we've had another commentator who highlights uh, the importance of this issue of, of public trust. Um, I frame my comment, Tom, about trust in the minority community, which is very sensitive to the use of who collects my data, uh, who's having access to what's on my cell phone, and that sort of thing. But this one enlarges that conversation and want us to understand and uses the, is the use cases, uh, what has happened with the Google Ascension Health, Practice Fusion, Purdue Pharma uh, uh, cases, all of those risks for the mill that, that teach us uh, lessons. And secondly, uh, someone uh, does note uh, how important it is that an employer-based contract tracing program, uh, which uh, this particular person is involved in, is still concerned about the disconnect that you have indicated, uh, Tom, in terms of not having access, uh, interoperable data connecting to the public health system and seeing this as a, a very real uh, challenge. Uh, and then lastly, um, we are reminded by the audience of the importance of research. And I think this is a good one, a very good thought that we need to have um, data going in for immediate use comes out to be used in research uh, days to years later. And we need to really make sure that we're including research in the design of the data going in so that will affect us to be able to, as Michael indicated earlier, have the learning health system uh, in real time, uh, be able to use things. Uh, Linda, thank you very much for your comments on the, the paucity and inadequacy of the current uh, public health system. Uh, that is frightening. And, and I think that goes well in hand with Jay's uh, 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 admonition. Be careful about innovation for innovation's sake. Just because it got fancy tools and, and whistles uh, doesn't mean much. Uh, we've got to make sure that these tools are being applied to help real people. But you've got to, as, as, as Tom has also indicated, we've got to have real people in the trenches doing the work. And Linda, I think your point is very good. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, good luck with your innovative work. We will all be following it carefully. Linda, thanks for your comments, Jay, for yours. And now I turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Perlin, to introduce the next session. Uh, that will be focused on the experience in New York. Thank well, you. Well, thank, th thanks so much, um, Reed. And um, uh, the speakers couldn't have done a better job in terms of setting the trajectory for uh, the conversation. I just remind everybody that um, you know th th today's session will um, uh, conclude with a panel discussion. That's a great time to have uh, further um, uh, discussion of the questions you're submitting by the Q and A, and uh, we will come to those. But um, the, the past few moments have really reminded me of my roots on um, biomedical informatics, where we used to quip, it's not the hardware that's the problem, it's not the software that's the problem, it's the warmware uh, that is the people. Uh, and um, uh, what we're really talking about um, are our values and trust uh, and culture. Uh, and um, it, it's really in that vein where I think our next speaker will bring together uh, the conjunction of, um, uh, of the digital tools um, for treatment and monitoring uh, with the challenges that we have culturally. So it's really my absolute delight to introduce Dr. Aletha Maybank, uh, who is um, uh, new to the uh, American Medical Association as Vice President and the inaugural uh, Chief Health Equity uh, Officer. She shares uh, a lineage with um, uh, Dr. Frieden in terms of um, uh, work in the New York City Department of Health Mental Hygiene, where she launched the Center for Health Equity, Equity uh, and did work um, really geared towards strengthening and amplifying um, uh, transformation of culture and public health practice by inviting equity uh, into uh, the health department's work. Uh, her work was not only recognized, but uh, it has been um, uh, adapted uh, to other city agencies and uh, even captured the attention of the CDC and World Health uh, Organization. Uh, so my delight to, to turn over to Dr. Maybank for the next few minutes. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, um, and pleasure to be here with you um, to speak about really the equity implications. I'm not going to get specific into the tools, but really what we should be considering more deeply as it relates to health equity. And a lot has already been elevated, which is fantastic, um, about the critical importance of having a lens and always an eye to 
um, a, a health equity, but I'm just going to go a little bit deeper into kind of root causes because um, something that uh, Tom Frieden mentioned was, you know, if we, we end up doing the same thing and same mistakes kind of over and over again. And I really feel if we don't get to those root causes and that root understanding related to culture and values and narratives, we're going to have a hard time really moving forward in um, really meeting this vision of equity that we all desire uh, to have. So next. So just the center is uh, very new. We're only uh, a little bit over a year now, um, really working to strengthen and amplify um, the American Medical Association's work around uh, equity. And just as a, as a basis, I always like to just say that for me, health equity really means that, you know, we all have the conditions and the resources, opportunities, and power to achieve optimal health. And I'll come back to this, you know, as we go throughout. But these four things are absolutely critical. You can't have one. We need all of them. Um, in order to achieve optimal health. And it's very clear during this time of COVID, before COVID, um, that this does not exist for all people and all communities um, across this country and really across this globe as well. Next. So this, is, this was in the Lancet and we've already heard about um, contact tracing and testing, but these are the many tools and ways in which um, di digital technology has been applied. Um, for COVID in terms of planning and, and response, for screening, clinical management, medical supplies, all these things we're very well aware of. But also very well aware of that there has not been lots of um, evidence or information or understanding in terms of the impact as it relates to, to equity, um, especially here in this country. We're already challenged with doing these things um, in this, this country, but also to add the lens of doing equity work has always been extremely uh, challenging. Next. And those so specific to this time of COVID, um, we're very clear and that there have been studies, I know we're gonna hear from um, New York uh, City in, in a few minutes um, about you know, showing that black and Latinx uh, patients definitely have fewer health televisits um, than whites and Asians um, during this time. And this isn't anything new. Um, and often what we're probably going to start seeing is really the exacerbation um, of these inequities um, that have already um, existed. Uh, and they exist, you know, in the, in the use of uh, patient portals, understanding that there's, there's just low use overall, but even so among um, racially marginalized communities and other marginalized communities, um, the use of, of mobile health and, and the access to, to apps, um, as was mentioned before, the cost, are they really fully relevant for folks culturally, linguistically? Um, and then, you know, telehealth specifically, do folks have even just the digital skills to be able to utilize these. And we know there are challenges um, already um, in engagement during this time of, of COVID-19. Next. And so the question of, you know, why, and then this, you know, for those of us who are come from the public health spec space, um, this is pretty familiar to us. You know, I've been in public health most of my career, and now I'm really squarely rooted um, in the healthcare side of things. Um, with the value um, that AMA's mission definitely speaks to the betterment of public health but also with the recognition um, of kind of the gap that exists um, and, and the divide that has been mentioned uh, several times between public health and the healthcare system and the tremendous need for us to do um, a better job as a, as a nation um, and, and as systems and leaders to come together and figure out what that come together means. But this is our way of really understanding that most of our activity within the healthcare space has really been operating mostly downstream now a greater appreciation of the living context of people's lives and the social conditions and drivers, broadband being one of those as a social determinant of health. And then also the, uh, more upstream, the structures and policies that impact those living conditions um, and either produce um, equity or, or, or actually more so produce inequities within this country. And then more deeply looking at the systems of power to the left and the systems of exclusion that actually oppress. And that's where I say we really need to get to and understand um, and operate in in order to really change the downstream um, opportunities that we're all looking to help support. Next. So to take this um, kind of the example really of um, digital health, um, lots of it has already been mentioned related to access. There are really these kind of five core areas um, in which we can really dissect more specifically and intentionally around where are those health equity gaps um, existing? And so we have device access, um, which is related to the device itself, but also the cost of the device, 
Um, and we always, already know there's lots of evidence, you know, showing that um, cost is a tremendous barrier. Um, and that also, you know, primarily for black and brown communities or black and Latinx adults, to be more specific, you know, they tend to be smartphone users only, and that can also provide a, and be a, a barrier as it relates to reliance if you don't have connectivity. Um, and we know that over 36% of black households, 30% of Latinx households actually lack access to devices, which is about three times um, higher for um, than um, Asians and, and whites. And then in terms of digital literacy, I, I shade this in because I think digital literacy covers several things and is a little bit more complex, but we have obvious literacy as it relates to reading level, literacy as it relates to language, um, literacy as it relates to just technology. Um, and then there's literacy as it relates to kind of security and privacy. Um, you know, and, and are people able to understand if the tools they're using are secure and private and, and, and be able to access that information. All of these have impact, and, and we know that a recent um, UCSF um, study of remote primary care visits during COVID-19 um, pandemic found early signs of exacerbated disparities in access for care for patient populations, especially with limited digital um, literacy and saw the decline of um, Blacks, Latinx, older patients, as well as those who are not speaking English. And so while we recognize that digital literacy is absolutely um, an inequity, but it also represents a problematic narrative, um, oftentimes by placing blame on the individual and the communities for a lack of adoption and a utilization of the patient, instead of really considering whether um, the design is relevant. And that has come up in the uh, earlier presentation, but oftentimes, these conversations in many places really stop at the first two device access and connectivity. So we have to make sure we're inclusive of all four of these. And then also looking at the problematic aspects of um, the healthcare delivery system and the inequities that exist there that have also been um, mentioned. Next. And so as we, if we break it down kind of similar to the, the image that I had before, we're clear that there's kind of, kind of the social drivers of why these inequities exist. Um, at the, the individual and the community level um, for each of these areas. Next. And then we understand also the that there are structural drivers and looking at the systems and the policies rather and the structures that set up these income inequities um, <clears throat> as well as inequities as it relates to what is accessible within certain communities, whether urban or rural, and it relates to broadband. Um, and then also, you know, going to the last as it relates to uh, design relevance rather to number four, you know, we know that tech solutions in this, com in this country really are primarily designed by and for young white heterosexual men. Um, and we have to really challenge um, that existence um, and that reality um, and, and focus more on how do we engage, you know, marginalized um, people and populations within these solution designs and next. And then ultimately, we have to look at the, the, the root cause, as was mentioned before. How is power playing out? The reality is power right, creates um, the opportunities for how decisions are made in all of these areas. Who has the opportunity to be powerful and make those decisions? Who has the money? Who has the resources? Who has the ability to redistribute resources? All are very important um, in, in this conversation around uh, digital health. And then our systems of, of racism that exclude, that structure opportunities. Um, that also assigns value um, to people and communities um, based on their skin color. But that can happen with many isms, um, whether it's, it's sexism or ableism. Uh, the reality is that may, oftentimes these decisions are excluding folks. Um, and, and we have to look at the narratives, as I mentioned earlier, that are being shaped, that are determining the actions um, that we have. Uh, and that's oftentimes where folks are not um, really considering, and I think this is really the front line of health equity at this point in time, is really addressing these dominant narratives. Next. <clears throat> and so these narratives exist in, in many areas of our, our society. Um, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. And we need to make sure that we are challenging them. And oftentimes they're obscuring our responsibility and the power that I mentioned before. Um, there's a great resource by uh, NATO that I highly recommend folks to, to check out because it really talks about and, and describes how these dominant narratives um, consistently show up um, and, and, and are barriers to how we understand what we're doing. Next. 
and they actually totally undermine our ability to advance equity um, and equity overall. And so uh, contexts such as unfortunate but not um, unnecessarily just. The, um, the frame that oftentimes I hear, especially in the healthcare space, but also in public health, that you know, folks are making you know, either right or wrong lifestyle choices without really understanding the full context of people's lives. And even if there is a better understanding now, how is our system really fully reflective of that, I think is, is a critical question for us as we move forward in, in doing this work. Um, and then uh, lots of othering, the, the myth of meritocracy, our American exceptionalism as if other folks we can't get great ideas from, the zero sum game. And then lastly, again, as I mentioned earlier, this hierarchy of human value based on skin color in which white supreme has lots of impact on how decisions are made in this country, especially as it relates to digital health and tools that are developed um, uh, in, our, in our systems. So next. So as we understand it, and we try to work towards um, breaking those dominant narratives um, and shaping designs and solutions that are more accessible, more equitable, uh, we need to, as uh, systems, whether it's healthcare or public health, private sector, public sector, consider and ask our questions, how do we ensure that our efforts and innovation do not discriminate, exacerbate inequities or deny um, care for people. This comes from this slide here and the, the questions here come from a racial equity toolkit from the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Um, really um, considering, you know, what are the benefits, who will be burdened, what are the unintended consequences as we develop um, these, these solutions at all different levels. And, and this is whether from the actual kind of practical technology side or and the policy area as well. Next. And then here are some examples of folks, um, and this is mostly more so kind of connected to the tech and healthcare side and private side, truthfully, um, that are centering equity um, within their efforts. Uh, and I, I won't go in detail through this slide, but uh, there here are some examples and the links will be there. But I also have in the right-hand corner, um, centering equity. This is uh, the 25th anniversary of the Tenney Central Public Health Services. And uh, this year they went through a process to re-envision these 10 essential services and equity is in, is in the context and is centered literally within the, the new uh, revision, um, but also throughout all of the new, the 10 essential services. And I think this really um, provides this opportunity that was mentioned early on and in several folks comments about this need to have a better collaborative nature between public health and um, healthcare, but also across other sectors, the public and private sectors, um, bringing those folks together who do know tech very well, but also know public health very well so that we can have um, much better solutions. So my last slide, um, just the call to action is, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, we have an anti-racist praxis, um, meeting that, next slide, thank you, um, meaning that, you know, we are setting up systems that do not exclude based on whether it's race, gender, sexual orientation, um, uh, gender identity, um, ableism, immigration status, whatever the, the um, identity is, um, that we are intentional about setting up those systems. And this is really critical in terms of what was mentioned earlier about um, improving trust amongst communities and making sure that they're relevant and making sure folks are at the very early stages. Um, changing the narrative, as I mentioned, and challenging the narratives and disrupting um, existing power structures that prevent us from creating optimal and equitable solutions, um, centering the expertise and experience of marginalized patients and all of our design um, uh, elements, uh, and then advocating for equitable distribution of resources at the policy level. So for, especially us in the um, healthcare sector, ensuring that we're acting more extreme um, and advocating more extreme, uh, we're sustaining and standardizing our universal telehealth coverage, everybody's aware of, equitable reimbursement and pay parity. Um, much has been mentioned already about the interoperability importance um, and security and privacy, and that we're also working to areas of having universal health care as well as just protecting our, our Affordable Care Act overall. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. That's an absolutely spectacular um, deconstruction of the relationship between um, 
what would purport to be technological solutions and the culture and dominant narrative that underlies the lapses in trust uh, that um, thwart both, ironically, the technology and simultaneously the application of the, the technology. Um, so many, many thanks for, for that and um, for the leading work that you are um, uh, taking on. Uh, we're going to now get a couple of reactions, and uh, in fact, you've set those up perfectly uh, as well. It's my uh, delight to ask for a brief response, and then uh, again, we welcome uh, questions. Dr. Gezer Ortega, who's lead faculty for research and innovation and equitable surgical care at the Center for Surgery and Public Health at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Uh, and then um, uh, you, you alluded to UCSF, Dr. Courtney Lyles, an associate professor at the um, University of California, San Francisco, Division of General Internal Medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, uh, where uh, she works with the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations uh, and um, in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. So let me ask Dr. Ortega to begin. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Maybank, for the insightful and informative presentation. Um, I agree with your statements and want to encourage policy that promotes interoperability, which has been said several times this morning, um, between these digital health technologies. It's key for us to um, move forward, but also improve reimbursement of digital health and other uh, policies as, um, and other technology, as you mentioned but also expanding the broadband access and digital devices among underserved patients um, especially. I think supporting and creating more programs like those mentioned um, in your talk are key, to develop, especially, are key to developing linguistically and culturally tailored digital health tools, uh, working with local and community stakeholders. Um, someone mentioned research in the Q&A session, which I think is incredibly important in making sure that research is part of this from the very beginning, as well as the patients um, and these different community organizations and providing training for the providers and the patients of these tools is a critical step. Um, even hearing from clinicians, the digital health expansion is difficult on both ends, not only for the patients, but also for the providers. And so where that training occurs and how it occurs will be especially key um, as we move forward. I, cannot stress enough the importance of the narrative. Um, I really uh, enjoyed how you highlighted that during your talk, but I think we really need to do more work on changing the narrative, especially around poverty and racial ethnic minorities in this country. And um, I think it's gonna be key to us moving forward. And, and furthermore, we have to be mindful of data privacy and integrity. It came up already in a couple of the discussions earlier today, but especially in populations whose trust has been compromised by a healthcare system. Um, in working towards equity, we should monitor our data to ensure that these digital health technologies are utilized among our diverse populations. And so I encourage um, healthcare institutions to continue to think of digital health boards or digital health equity dashboards as they move to implement digital health technologies within their system so that we can make sure that we're monitoring and collecting data on who's utilizing the systems and that these key stakeholders are involved in the design, the implementation in every single step, but that as was mentioned earlier, that we also have the opportunity to adapt quickly. Um, one of the advantages that technology affords is this adaptability in a much more efficient but quicker way than we've traditionally have. And I think collecting that data in order for us to do so will be critical. So, Again, thank you for the informative talk and um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you very much for your comments, Dr. Ortega. And now let's go over to Dr. Lyles. Good morning. Good morning, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation, Dr. Maybank. Thank you so much for setting forward many of the core principles of how to set us back on a path forward. Um, I wanted to first underscore two, two things that were brought up um, and to give maybe slightly uh, more concrete examples of some assets that we might want to leverage to move those forward. The first being the structural barriers for broadband and digital access in the country and really thinking about that as a social determinant of health. I can't stress that enough in terms of the work that we've been doing in San Francisco and in partnership with things like the, the mayor's office in San Francisco, the Office of Community Development and Housing that has a digital equity initiative and is doing a lot of work and um, trying to uh, work with community-based organizations and also the private sector to actually advance some of those skills. And from my perspective where I sit is um, there are many organizations out there. And if we think about the strengthening of the relationships and the community-based organizations who have expertise in 
um, in the communities that they serve, that perhaps we can both advocate for broadband as a fundamental utility and also make sure that the community-based organizations that are already in the communities of interest can do better work to expand their services um, for skills training or for whatever uh, clients and individuals want to work on to be able to take advantage of some of the tools um, that, that are out there. That's one thing I wanted to say. And the second point you made about the co-design of um, technology for the end user and the gaps potentially between the private sector and what the end users are, I just wanted to make a statement that I think we need to be rethinking how we interact with the private sector and maybe thinking about um, working with them in a different way to, to, to enforce and to ensure that our perspectives and our long history of working with end users can be implemented. And again, this is where academia and community-based organizations who have the expertise probably need to have their expertise front and center to say that these are the end users um, for testing a technology rather than um, just anybody sort of testing it and making sure it works, but making sure the person who really is going to use it is actually in the center of the process. So those two, I just can't stress enough from my work, um, the importance of those. And then lastly, I wanted to end um, just with two comments about the shift and potentially a silver lining of COVID, um, maybe in a reshifting of how we think about digital technologies nationwide as not no longer a nice to have um, for how we do work, but a need to have of how we do this work and that we can still uh, honor um, how people want to interact with tools and how they want to interact with healthcare systems, but make sure that we're, um, that we're offering these as a fundamental part of what we do and allowing people's preferences to engage in them the way that they want to engage in them. And at San Francisco General Hospital, where I sit, 10 years ago, more than 70% of our patients were interested in digital communication with their healthcare providers through existing in-person relationships with their doctor. And so I don't think it's the interest that's keeping us back. I really think it's the, the tapping into the trust and tapping into the, the access, the skills, and the usability components that have already been brought up here that we have just not addressed um, in, a, in a fundamental way. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to end with, you know, thinking about the safety net healthcare delivery systems and social service sector um, that disproportionately care for, you know, lower income Americans um, and Medicaid populations in the nation. And then that the structural conditions um, in terms of lack of robust EHR infrastructure, um, understaffing ratios in those delivery systems, I think those, they themselves need um, investment to be able to do this. And, and they have many assets for um, many long, decades of history of, of delivering really high quality care. And so they need to be engaged in a different way in this digital transformation than perhaps we've done before. So thank you again, and just a really great presentation. Happy to be here. Well, thank you for those comments. And we have uh, a couple moments for some um, uh, Q&A. Again, I remind people that the Q&A um, uh, function is open. And let me thank um, Dr. Ortega and Dr. Lyles for those comments. And, um, and Dr. Maybank, um, I want to ask you a question, um, I take the prerogative of, of, of first question out, which is that um, we, we've heard both of the reactors suggest mechanisms to initiate um, more socially just culturally responsive mechanisms for development of technologies and incorporation of individuals populations that have been disenfranchised but we've also got a systems issue which is that however noble the efforts are independently unless there's a framework to unite um, we may not be able to weave them together uh, it won't be a tapestry, but rather point solutions. W what is your suggestion to the National Academy of Medicine? What is your perspective at the American Medical Association of, of how it's a both end, not an even either or? I don't want to diminish the nobility of the individual efforts, but unless they tie together, um, I don't think we can achieve the type of levered progress that, uh, that we'd hope for. Uh, I thought I'd just give you that easy question, Dr. Mayfield. And, um, Look forward to your yeah, uh, uh, easy question. <laughs> um, I, you know, it, it's an important question, and I think, um, you know, one that clearly I think as systems, as you're saying, that we struggle with as institutions, we struggle with. So I think, you know, one is first just going to the narrative. I think what's clear is I don't feel everybody, and you use the word noble, but I don't feel everybody really values that. And 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 to me, the value really shows up in the actions. You know, and I and I say oftentimes 
if we're thinking about relationship building and we're thinking about building trust and we take it to the context of our own personal lives, this may seem a little wonky or, or soft, but the reality is, is that it's not particularly rocket science to do to some level. Um, it's something that we value. We know it's important in order to build trust. So you find ways to do it. And so I feel as systems, you find ways to do it, you know, and it, but it has to be your intention. It has to be your value. And so we can do it as in individual institutions. The, the infrastructure um, in terms of how does that all come together within the system in the context of it, how do we um, enforce that into policy? I'm not fully clear, but what I am clear about the opportunities is to engage people in policy making. So when you do have structure, so New York Academy of Medicine as an example, who sits on your, your, your places and spaces in terms of beyond us who are professionalized per se, but how do you also diversify who is informing what you do and how you um, set up your, your agendas, you know, or, or set up your um, strategic planning or whatever it is. Um, those are the opportunities where we can get um, ideas individually as the institution, but then also how do we figure out how do we work more collaboratively because you have other voices, other opportunities to have innovation that you've never had before. And I just don't think we've really tapped into that in this country in many of our institutions of power because it has not been a value. And I think at the core of it, we have to really value it. We say it's noble, but I don't really see the action behind it oftentimes. Well, well thanks Dr. Van Kerr for those thoughts. And I, I think that reinforces the importance of this convening. Um, let, let me ask uh, also Dr. Ortega, Dr. Lyles, if you'd like to weigh in on how we, how we unify um, uh, more localized action with um, um, a larger um, uh, sort of societal effort to um, uh, make progress technologically and culturally? I think the way I would chime in there is that um, a lot of the, the, the federal policies and reimbursement can really lay the groundwork for the standardization and the, the basic um, infrastructure that's needed to do some of this work is sort of how I, I see that question. And we can't do it, we can't share data between public health systems and, and community-based organizations and, and healthcare delivery systems without that, that large scale investment. But the local knowledge uh, on the ground in the communities is really gonna be uh, the ability to take it to the next level, like without giving them the freedom and the flexibility to uh, implement things that, that are uh, tailored to the needs um, of uh, citizens in their community. I think that's, to me, that's the balance or the interaction between those two that can actually move things forward. Great, great, thank you. Dr. I agree, Ortega? I, I agree with the comments that have been made as well. And I think that one of the key aspects of this is also, um, addressing the differences between hospital and healthcare organizations. Um, I'm fortunate to be at a healthcare organization that has, um, uh, is well resourced, but there are many hospitals that are not. And so sometimes we have to be mindful of asking too much of our hospitals or, or if they can't, um, even with digital dashboards or even doing some of this digital health technology, do they have the capacity to, or the capability to set these things up to provide these to patients? And so we either have to provide federal support or some type of funding that will provide some equity even within the healthcare providers that are providing these services. And I definitely think federal mandates move the agenda a lot further and a lot um, more than what we would do if we just kind of had just basic or local um, efforts. But I think involving the community um, in creating these tools is key. Um, because you can't not create this digital health technology without their voice. Um, it won't work, it won't be effective, and um, we just won't get where we want to be without our patients. Well, thank you very much for those comments. Um, um, it's interesting in the reactions, um, I, I'm hearing a, a sort of recapitulation, but in the opposite direction of um, Dr. Maybank's um, slide on upstream five main drivers um, behind inequities in digital health. Uh, and um, what I heard um, from both of the responders, Dr. Ortega and Dr. Lyles, was um, really the reimbursement, the, the money, and um, you know, and uh, Dr. Maybach did a masterful job of really describing how that controls the narrative. And so changing the narrative through those resourcing really changes the alignment of the structures uh, that, um, uh, you know, at least um, uh, to my ear, 
uh, would seem to be one of the more levered ways of um, achieving the progress that we'd aspire to. So um, my thanks to um, uh, the two reactors and especially to Dr. Maybank for just a, a fantastic um, a presentation that once again, I think tees up uh, the next um, uh, discussion uh, extremely well. And with that, I'm delighted to, to hand um, the podium back to um, our Reed Texan. Well, thank you very much and a great panel. And I think uh, Courtney Lyles uh, did a nice transition for us to the, uh, the next panel, which is focusing on the local level. And we're going to turn to a big local level, and that's, of course, New York. Uh, I want to have to say that as we uh, turn to and enjoy uh, Dr. Ted Long from New York City Health and Hospitals, uh, Dr. Long, that obviously we will never as a society be ever to uh, give enough praise to your colleagues for the work that they have done, are doing, and unfortunately may well be soon doing again under extraordinary circumstances. You all have been a beacon of the highest level of, of health professionalism uh, that, uh, that modern society has ever seen. And so uh, our commendations and applause to you uh, still ring loudly, I hope, in your ears. And so thank you for sharing the experience of contact tracing uh, in New York in a case study. Take it away, Dr. Long. Well, thank you for having me, and it's an honor to be with you all today. Uh, and just reflecting on what you were saying a moment ago, um, when we look back in New York City to March and April, which were our hardest months um, when the crisis was really hitting its peak for us, um, we all came together in New York City. And in particular, we had people that trained in our public hospital system that flew back to spend weeks with us on a volunteer basis just to help to serve the people and the institutions that trained them to be, be who they were. And uh, it was a, a glimmer of hope and a, a really bright light in an otherwise very, very dark time. So I just, I appreciate your words, thank you. Um, so today I'm here with you to talk about contact tracing. What I, just to give myself a quick introduction, I'm the executive director of the Test and Trace Corps, the part of New York City that's charged with doing testing and contact tracing for the city. Um, it's housed within our public health care system, um, New York City Health and Hospitals, of which I am Senior Vice President. So what I'm going to do today for you all is talk through three things. First, I'm going to talk about what our program is, what the Test and Trace Corps is. Second, I'm going to share with you a couple of results to give you a flavor for the, what we've been able to do so far with the program. And then third, I'm going to focus in on the theme of today, which is the new notification app we have and the problems it solves and how it links together with everything else that we're doing. So go to the next slide. Uh, so I'll start off with the program overview here. So what we've done in New York City is we've taken what we consider the three core components of uh, an effective program to suppress the coronavirus and put them all in one place because they all are inextricably in our mind intertwined. There's testing, there's tracing, and then there's how we actually help people to isolate if they're a case or to quarantine if they're a contact. So I'll walk through each briefly now. In terms of testing in New York City, we've aggressively built out testing locations. We have more than 300 locations across New York City. It's a, we have a universal testing policy, come one, come all. It's not appointment based, you can walk right up and all tests are free. We have a number, 212 COVID-19, it'll tell you where the nearest test is close to you. Uh, in New York City, we're doing now more than 30,000 tests a day in a city of 8.6 million people. We've gone up to 46,000 tests per day. If you look at that on a per capita basis, it's the most, as far as I know, of any major city in the country. And actually, it's up there in terms of um, comparison to other countries. It's more than European countries like Germany or Asian countries like South Korea. In terms of tracing, the purpose of testing is to identify how we can then uh, do tracing, to identify our cases. So our tracing team is just shy of 4,000 tracers. They speak 40 languages. And one of the unique things, which is a thread I'm going to weave through everything I talked to you about today, including how we think about the app, is how we selected our tracers. Now, we could have gone with a third party in another city, state, country, but we decided to have our tracers all be New Yorkers. And well over half of them, it's actually closer to two thirds, are from the hardest hit communities across New York City. So when somebody is calling you on the phone or knocking on your door, this is somebody that's lived through the same thing that you did in March and April that we were talking about a few minutes ago, that same nightmare. They get it. They know what you went through then and what you're going through now. Um, and oftentimes they're actually from your actual community. Um, we think that that's been our secret ingredient in terms of the success we've had, which I'm gonna to talk to you about in the results. The third pillar of our program 
is take care. And in other words, this is how we enable people to be successful to keep themselves, themselves their families, and their communities safe. Um, if you're a case we are, or a contact or even a traveler coming from one of the New York state designated other states, which has been in excess of 30, um, we'll offer you free hotel stay. Um, and that the hotel is a comprehensive medical program, including a comprehensive behavioral health program. We even give you free pajamas when you walk through the door. Or if you want to isolate or quarantine at home, we'll do everything in our power to help you from food delivery to help with medications to telehealth even to legal aid or helping you with eviction notices. We really want to make this as easy for you because we understand how hard it is. And I'm going to talk to you in just a moment about the results in terms of in New York City, the proportion of people isolated and quarantined that we confirm every day. So let's go to the next slide. Without further ado, let me tell you about our accomplishments so far. So next slide. The first benchmark we set out for ourselves in terms of our program is from a contact tracing perspective, you can't do anything if you can't reach people. So we said from the beginning that we wanted to reach 90% of all new cases across New York City. You can see when we started our program, we launched on June 1st, we weren't quite there. I remember on day one, I, was, uh, I learned that we didn't have a phone number for 15% of people, so <laughs> we had some room for improvement. Um, but we did improve and we were able to use databases, calling doctor's offices to get the phone numbers for people. And you can see actually our approach was fairly aggressive in the beginning and we were able to drive up um, the proportion of people we were able to reach. And our denominator here is all cases, anybody in New York City that's diagnosed with coronavirus, they're all our denominator here. And we're consistently now above 90%, which was the benchmark we'd set out for ourselves. Next slide. Oh, sorry, yeah, there we go. The next benchmark was more of a reach for us. So we know from different modeling studies, and we set this up well before we were even close to reaching it, um, that we need to be completing in interviews or intake with 75% of all new cases across New York City and getting them to isolate in order to make an effective difference in suppressing the coronavirus and driving the levels down. Um, you can see in the very beginning of our program, we were just, uh, just north of 50%, so room for improvement. But we climbed and we climbed and we implemented different strategies along the way. I mentioned that our tracers are from our communities. Well, what, we ended, what we had them do is we created a role called a community engagement specialist. So we're not only calling you on your phone, but we're knocking on your door from somebody from your community. And you can see our numbers shot up to 78% when we really got off the, that up and off the ground. And we've been pretty consistently at or above our 75% benchmark, which again, we know from modeling studies is where we need to be to drive the virus down. I'll tell you that since we started the program, June 1st, we've driven down the number of new cases in New York City every day and the percent of all people testing positive by two thirds for each of those different metrics since we started doing the program on June 1st. We are right now seeing an uptick. I'm happy to talk about that at the end here and that's why I'm just joining you a few minutes late here. Um, but we've been uh, at one of the lowest levels in the country in terms of the virus. Next slide. So in terms of isolation and quarantine, the question on your mind is probably, well, people, you're reaching them, you're getting them to complete your intake, but how do you know if they're actually isolating or quarantining? Uh, so what we do is we talk to people every single day, every case, every day, every contact, every day. And 96% of all of our cases that complete our intake, which is well, which is north of 75%, confirm for us every single day that they're isolating. They're staying at home, they're not leaving, they're playing by the rules, and they're accepting our help. Same thing for contacts, 93%. They're confirming for us when we talk to them every single day, and they're picking up the phone when we call that they're staying at home. To be clear on this point, there's two reasons I think why this is happening. One, I think our tracers are the right people. I think people trust our tracers. I think if they didn't, they wouldn't do this, nor would they even pick up the phone. I think trust is the most important thing. Behind that, I think our third pillar, which is a little bit unique to us in New York City, we make it possible for people. A lot of people don't have lost their job, have a lot of financial and other hardships. By us delivering food, helping them with medications, helping them with legal health, eviction notices, that's what makes this possible. If we didn't do those things and didn't have the right tracers to build trust, we wouldn't come close to numbers like this. So I'm proud of our work and I think that those are two key reasons how we've gotten here. Next slide but we want to do more. So uh, I'm going to tell you now about our COVID exposure app, which is something you can think of as built 
on top of everything I've shared with you so far. I wanted to give you a flavor for our program, how we built it, how we've used it, how we've really focused on building trust as a cornerstone of our program. And now we're thinking of the app as an enhancement on top of all of that. Next slide. So in a nutshell here, you can see on the right hand side is a screenshot of the app and I have a couple more on my subsequent slides too. To give you lay of the land, we rolled this app out last week, so it's new for us. Uh, a, a mass notice was sent out. We're encouraging all New Yorkers to download the app. Um, lab confirmed cases enroll in our program. And then what happens is when a lab confirmed, when a, a, a person becomes the case that's lab confirmed and they're talking to our tracers, there is a validation code that's given to them that pushes out anonymously information to people that they could have, that they did, they did per the app expose um, during their infectious period contacts or people that were within the exposure zone for what the app detects are encouraged to get tested in quarantine. And I'll show you a couple more of those uh, slides in a moment. So next slide. Okay. So what you can see here, th these are actual screenshots, is this is how you sign up for it. So you go, you get started, you enable the app. When you enable the app, there, all of the data is anonymous. The validation codes are kept with the Association of Public Health Laboratories. We don't keep that. Um, and there's no location used for your cell phone either. So this is not one of those things where your location is being tracked. That feature is not part of this whatsoever. We do not have that ability. The only ability that this app confers is an, a proximity. So if somebody's within six feet of you for more than 10 minutes, that's the only thing the app detects. You could be wherever you are in the city, doesn't matter. We don't get your location. We only get the proximity of you to somebody else that also has the app that has become a case. Next slide. So let's say that happens. Let's say you have the app, you're going about your daily business, and you've been within six feet for more than 10 minutes of somebody that has been diagnosed with coronavirus and has chosen to anonymously push out to anybody else with the app that they, um, have become a case. We, they're, they're, we would never know their name or anything like that. It's all completely anonymous. The only thing you would see is what's on the screen here. You'd see the app has detected that on September 1st, 2020, someone who tested positive for COVID-19 was within six feet of you for over 10 minutes. Then you're given instructions about what you can do. We recommend separating yourself, not having visitors. We give you some more instructions about how to do that. Cornerstone of this, of course, is to come get tested. And then finally, to give this our New York flavor, is um, we do have our COVID hotline, 212-COVID-19, that provides the totality of all of those services, including a personal connection of you to a resource navigator to talk through what you need to stay at home or to go to one of our hotels free of charge. We'll pick you up free of charge too. Um, all of those things are made available for you through that hotline that you can call all while remaining anonymous. Next slide. And that's, the, that's our program and that's the app. So I wanted to, again, today give you a broad overview of our approach in New York City about how we wanna build trust, how we've linked key components of the fight against coronavirus together, some of our initial results and uh, how we think of the app as an enhancement on the base of trust in the structure that we've built. Uh, and I'd look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate you setting the table so well. Uh, I, I can't wait for the Q&A and we've already got a couple for you, but before we get to that, we're really, really pleased that, uh, that Dr. Uh, Gasser from Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University is here to offer some reacting comments. Uh, uh, take it away, please. Thank you so much uh, for having me and thank you, Dr. Long, for all the wonderful work you're doing, you and your colleagues, uh, which obviously is absolutely key. Um, I was asked to take two steps back and some sort of zoom out a little bit. Uh, and I was hoping to share with you maybe two or three observations with respect to the uh, exposure notification apps that were just introduced based on a set of country case studies we've been doing um, looking at Asia and Europe, where some of these apps have been used uh, for quite a while and share some of the experiences from there. 
And I would say that um, these exposure notification apps are some sort of a real world case study that both demonstrate the importance of bridging the world of technology and public health, uh, as well as amplifying the importance of creating a trust environment. And so uh, it's a real world uh, important uh, case study that illustrates some of the topics of the previous uh, panels as well. So the first um, uh, observation from, from these uh, various country case studies is that um, exposure notification apps are an important tool in the toolkit um, as we use digital uh, technology in response to the current pandemic. But of course, by no means can replace human contact tracing, which was uh, very nicely explained by Dr. Long, uh, but are merely complementary. Uh, I think one point that we've also seen with now early evidence from Europe is that even low adoption rates of these apps may actually help in our response to the pandemic. There was actually uh, some earlier uh, studies suggesting, well, these apps only help, uh, are only effective if you have very high adoption rates, over 50%, which by the way, almost no one reaches so far, uh, no country, but there is now evidence that suggests even lower adoption rates, 15% adoption rates may be helpful. So uh, important message, download these apps, use these apps. Uh, they help even if um, they're below a, um, a threshold of 50%. The second observation I would like to share is that we need to um, take adoption barriers seriously. As I just mentioned, um, you know, many of us hope, of course, that these apps are widely used. And um, however, country experiences from Asian Europe suggest we should be cautiously optimistic about it. Adoption rates have been relatively low, somewhere between 15 to 20 percent in, in many of the European countries, uh, even in very high trust environments, by the way. Um, and so why is that? Uh, I think there are two reasons to amplify. One is uh, there are uh, important participation gaps. Uh, so for instance, we, we have some early evidence um, that you know, there are technology barriers. These uh, technologies um, and exposure apps require um, certain um, uh, generations of mobile phones. Uh, some people, particularly elderly people, may not have access to these devices. There are also important um, behavioral barriers and even skill gaps at times that we should take seriously right now, but also, of course, um, taking the long view as we are learning for the next uh, a public health crisis that, you know, unfortunately seems, seems um, to come at some point. Um, a second uh, issue with respect to these adoption barriers is going back to the, to the notion of trust, which was emphasized so much throughout the presentations. We see um, concerns uh, if we survey people uh, and ask them, why don't you download the app? There are concerns about how the data is used. I would also add, uh, in addition to these data privacy concerns, that there are uh, concerns about uh, cybersecurity implications and possible uh, data breaches. So we should keep that in mind too. Um, and then lastly, also trust issues, not only with respect to these data governance questions and data security questions, but also, well, what happens once I get a notification? What do I do then? And I thought it was really uh, helpful um, in the New York example to uh, have much more guidance than some of the precursors we've seen in Europe where people were a little bit lost and without guidance, uh, what to do next. So taken together, and this is my third and last point, I, I do think both um, uh, the promise of, of this approach using digital tools to supplement human contact tracing and some of the barriers and the cautionary uh, learnings highlight the critical role of communication and awareness raising throughout the process. So we've seen that some governments have done very well in creating the app, do a, um, engage in inclusive design process, communicate with the public what the app is about. But as soon as the app was launched, 
actually the communication strategy by the public health officials fell apart. And there were like, you know, rumors coming up and mixed signals uh, from different authorities. And that has created, even in a high trust environment, um, some confusion that um, apparently uh, hindered adoption quite a bit. So I think there's a big lesson learned. Uh, communication doesn't stop when the app is rolled out, but should go on and should be as consistent as possible. Um, the last point on this um, communication issue is also not only to think about consistency on the public health side throughout the life cycle of such a app, but also involve community leaders. Um, to reach um, the, the particular communities we, we want to, to engage, uh, underrepresented communities, in, in particular underserved communities. Um, this is important for all the reasons that have been mentioned around trust, um, also bridging um, language barriers and, and the like. And we do think involving community leaders uh, can help um, to remedy or build bridges in uh, particularly low trust uh, environments. So I stop here. These are just a few reflections and takeaways from other countries. And I uh, would like to uh, thank again, uh, Dr. Long and his, his team uh, for driving the work now locally in New York. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Gasser. And let me introduce now Emiliano Falcon uh, Morano from the American Civil Liberties Association for his observations. Thank you, doc. Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Long, for that presentation and for the amazing and much needed work you are all doing uh, in this pandemic. And thank you, Dr. Gasser, for your comments. This is a very interesting conversation that we are having, uh, and I'm very glad to be part of it. Now, first of all, I would like to add some nuance to, to the public conversation and challenge uh, the technological determinism or, or tech solutionism, especially when this is drove by white heteronormative supremacy, as Dr. Maybank in the previous panel mentioned. We oftentimes see that the use uh, of technology itself, it's accepted because it is inevitable. And, and, and that should not be the case, not only for this pandemic, but also for every other social issue. Now we are in the middle of a public health crisis with health, social, and economic implications and needs. As said here today, technology must not be an end on itself. It must have a supporting role. This means that we have to analyze how technology can help from a public health perspective and with a clear and transparent public health purpose and goal. For example, will the use of technology uh, throw the figures that Dr. Dr. Long showed uh, for the analog contact tracing, those amazing figures of, of people complying with, with the isolation and quarantine, will the use of a digital technology uh, help achieve these, these figures, right? Moreover, there is a problem with the allocation of resources during the pandemic. Do we want money invested in technology that is inaccurate and maybe doesn't work? Or do we want money invested in social services? There is always an economic and social cost of using technology and that should be taken into account. The use of digital technologies should not make things worse, especially for marginalized communities. COVID-19 is already hitting those groups harder than others and technology should not make this worse. In this vein now, it is not clear uh, how digital technologies would help accomplish these public health objectives and to what extent. But before anything, we have to acknowledge, acknowledge that there are many things we don't know about the coronavirus, especially when it comes to how it spreads. Over dispersion and super spreading of this virus are found in research across the globe. A growing number of studies estimate that a majority of infected people may not infect a single other person. For example, a recent paper uh, published last week uh, found that in Hong Kong, which had extensive testing and contact tracing, about 19% of cases, 19, were responsible for 80% of the transmission. 80%, so 19% of cases responsible for 80% of the transmission, while 69% of cases did not infect any single person. So we have to be humble. If there are so many things we don't know, at least we can come up with a technology to magically solve it. 
And now, apart from these issues, from accuracy issues, from data management and privacy issues which were dealt uh, here today, and how the technology effectively works, for example, the capacity of Bluetooth to go through walls should be taken into account. The use of digital technologies presents two additional set of problems. First, we have to consider how widespread the adoption of the digital technology by the people will be. This goes to the trust that Dr. Long was mentioning with contact tracing, being from the communities they are involved. That's an excellent idea, but it's hard to imagine how this would be achieved with an app, right? It's different to be approached by someone who is from your neighborhood than to receive a text or a notification in your cell phone saying that you have to quarantine or you have to self-isolate. And also, if large numbers of people fail to adopt the app, it won't end up mean, uh, achieving anything meaningful. I, 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 I just, we just heard Dr. Gasser uh, talking about this research about uh, the low amount of people adopting the app and it might be helpful, but that's not a subtle question yet. So we have to evaluate how likely it is to overcome this trust and also political issues, right? Uh, to achieve the widespread app adoption, we are having problems uh, um, getting people to wear a mask because that's seen as political. How would, how would we, how, how can we um, overcome the fact that downloading an app may be a political, right? Second, we have to consider the availability of testing and how this couples with the available technology. Because even if we were able to overcome all these uh, substantial trust and adoption barriers, the use of an exposure notification app like the one New York City is using that we just saw or Virginia is using might even set back public health and economic uh, recovery efforts. That's because people being notified of, of a potential exposure would be asked to report for testing and then be forced to wait up to seven to 10 days for the results. We've seen these people waiting for seven, 10 days for the results. And this delay has two consequences. First, a large number of people uh, would quarantine for no good reason, which would in turn reduce trust in the overall public health system and in the app itself, and also frustrate economic recovery. And second, the highest delays in testing that we are seeing occur with free testing provided by local and state governments which is the one used by low-income marginalized communities. So all these things have to be taken into account. We don't want these communities to fear getting tested because that will mean that they could lose their jobs because they cannot go for, for two weeks or even get their jobs closed for two weeks if they test positive. So, so I think we should be uh, very careful with all these tech solutions that are offered and with a lot of interest behind all this, all this technology uh, um, and, and we need rapid testing. That's what we need right now. And, and so we have all this rapid testing and people, um, especially for marginalized communities, getting access to rapid testing. Uh, we're going to talk about a, an effective uh, contact tracing app. And then lastly, and, and kind of uh, as an afterthought, um, I would also like to mention that all these digital technologies uh, are not shielded from possible attacks by bad actors, all these cybersecurity risks risks. Let's imagine, for example, a cyber attack on against one of these apps in the day before election day that mandates thousands, if not millions of people to quarantine. Uh, the consequences of this can be tremendous and, and really very harmful for democracy. So, so I think all these issues uh, uh, should be taken into account. And, and thank you very much. And, and looking forward for the uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Emiliano. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a tough time with the Q&A because we've got to get to the panel discussion. But let me ask, Ted, if you could rapid fire just really, really fast. Number one, uh, why the lack of Yiddish speaking contact tracers? So as the um, epidemic has progressed in New York City, we're actually pretty nimble. So we hire more people as needed. So what in New York City right now, as you're alluding to, we are seeing an uptick in certain communities, in particular communities that are Yiddish speaking. So what we do well is we hire quickly. We actually were able to get our program up and running, designed and hired within two to three weeks. Um, so we're adjusting that now. And the other thing, which is important to note about our approach in New York City as well, is we aren't limited to Yiddish speaking contact tracers. Why not use Yiddish speaking community based organizations that are already trusted in our communities? Great. Why can't they help Perfect. Us? Um, Next one, real quick. Um, you need to cl cl remind people again does a tracer contact the same case day after day? Does a tracer build a relationship with the case? Sometimes, not necessarily. It could be two Good. different. If you have an app, 
That's great. You're doing great, man. If you have the app and you're around anyone else with the app, and then two days you get tested or positive, then you can you choose to send the notification to everyone you were in contact with in those previous three days? Yes. Good. Do large apartment buildings trick the app? If you're like within six feet apart, do they really go up or down a floor or two? I'm not sure about that. I, I think probably, but I would have to double check. How many New York people have uploaded your app since it launched? Any idea? Oh, I can, we can get back on that. I don't know. That's right. Good. And then lastly, um, can the exposure notification app warn the user so they do not spend 10 minutes in proximity to an infected person? In other words, can it serve as an early warning device? That's not how it's currently built, but I think it's an interesting idea that I could take back and share with the team that developed it. See how smart Lisa Kunin is? Okay. Hey, thank you for those, man. Uh, and now I'll turn it thank back you. to John for the uh, and reactors. Thank you. Thank you to our reactor panel. Uh, and thank you, Ted. And please, again, uh, anybody you see among your colleagues, let them know that we, at the, all of us at the National Academy of Medicine and everybody around the country continues to be in awe of how wonderful you all have performed. And I turn it now back to John Perlin. Well, 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 thank you, Reid. And uh, what a tremendous succession of um, presentations and reactions we've had. Uh, I think in many ways, this is really um, uh, the most important part where this is where we translate what we've heard uh, into um, uh, potentially some recommendations that um, uh, help guide us to uh, address. So um, we have a number of questions that have come in through the Q&A and I promise you we will get to um, uh, those that we have, have not yet been answered. Uh, but at this juncture, we, we've actually heard a, a, a lot of agreement in certain areas, for example, the role of culture and narrative in terms of sh shaping technology adoption. Um, but we've also heard some um, uh, viewpoints that are not necessarily aligned, um, uh, for example, um, uh, on uh, what seems to be an assumption, um, Emiliano, you made the comment, um, uh, it's a white hitter in order to view that um, technology adoption is inevitable. Uh, and um, uh, I, I think that we should begin by asking our presenters and panelists uh, to have a moment to um, uh, see if they have questions for each other. So let me step back uh, before going to more structured um, uh, set of questions that have come in uh, and open it to our questions and panelists uh, in terms of um, uh, what you've heard, um, our, our presenters and panelists, in terms of what you've heard um, uh, that um, you think are points that we need to extract uh, and or um, uh, challenge further. As our panelists are getting to do that, uh, Jonathan, I would want to add and focus in on, I think, and again, and I don't know if, uh, if, uh, of, uh, if uh, we, we have still on the line, um, the people from the first panel, but I know this issue again of distrust has continued to come up and particularly for minority communities who are already uh, in the middle of this pandemic struggling so much with the past legacy of, of, uh, of the Tuskegee syphilis study, and all of those elements which are making them uh, distrustful of vaccine, uh, 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 vaccine and clinical trial participation. And I'm wondering uh, uh, in that regard also uh, clearly distrusting of the use of data uh, that is being collected. And I hope that and wonder whether or not uh, as part of the, as our panelists are starting to think of it, their questions to each other are, that someone might give us a little more insight into that uh, challenging issue. Well, I had a question for New York City, which touches on the issue of distrust. I was interested that you were able to offer everyone uh, support, uh, hotel rooms, et cetera, uh, here in, in the Midwest and certainly uh, in Chicago, what I'm most familiar with. Uh, we've had real trouble uh, getting that level of support for the contact tracing. We still are having trouble just hiring the numbers of people that we project we need. The city of Chicago is trying to outsource some of that to our community-based organizations. But, but again, I'm curious about what involvement, first of all, how that was funded and what involvement community-based organizations around New York City have in vetting and sort of endorsing the efforts of your shop to come in and ask all these questions. Yeah, that, this is Ted. Great question. So um, the way that we've structured it in New York City is we wanted to build a program, an organization, if you will, where our tracers, it's very regimented, you know, they're all in the same computer system. Um, they're all getting the same notes about who to call. They can share notes amongst each other, things like that. 
we receive with their recommendations though about who we hire from community-based organizations. So in my mind, it's sort of the best of both worlds because we get the right people recommended by the community-based organizations, but then we figure out all the details about how to actually run the program. And I think that it did take us a few weeks to really get our feet under us doing that, but now we're off to um, you know, a running start. Uh, community-based organizations are also important in their own right to partner with, to uh, do a variety of other things. In particular, um, I really rely on our community-based organizations to bring people in for testing. You can't do any contact tracing if you don't test people initially. So whenever we find that there is an uptick in one of our communities, we bring in all of our mobile, uni mobile units, rapid testing machines, but then we work with CBOs to bring the people in, the people from our communities. And that when we've done that, we've actually been able to drive down the percent of people testing positive in our communities to date by more than two thirds uh, by working with CBOs, getting the word out, um, and then bringing people in for testing. And I have one more question. I don't know. I don't want to take what. What about this decision not to go with the health department in New York City, but to go with health and hospitals? Uh, can you enlighten me as to the thinking that resulted in that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's one of those things out there in the world that's a little bit of a, um, a, a misnomer. Um, I, the health department at Health and Hospitals do all of this in lockstep. So all of the data that we get is used to drive the cluster evaluation that the health department does. Um, I'm right now supposed to be on the phone with the health department. <laughs> um, their, their commissioner, Dave, and I talk literally 20 times a day. Um, so we've designed and, and do all of this completely together. Very honestly, I don't think either of us uh, could have done it alone. I think that it's our synergy bringing everything together, the, the tools that each of us have that's made us successful. But we do that, we're doing this completely collaboratively. You can ask them. Also, and I would also add to that, just because I've been in New York City at the Department of Health as Deputy Commissioner, and I think one of the opportunities that New York City has is that there is a mechanism of preparedness as it relates to equity anyway, right? So prior to COVID coming around, there was a lot of intention at the health department level, especially, and I know it was building at H plus H as well, um, to have, there's a center for health equity, there's dedicated staff to thinking through how to integrate um, within systems and structures of emergency preparedness and response, equity responses. So I, I just, I think that's part of the work, right? Building the trust comes before the time of um, the epidemic. And I'm not saying it's, or the pandemic, it's not optimal now. There's still, everybody still has their challenges clearly, but there was some work and groundwork set in terms of ensuring that processes were, or were going to be equitable in those systems and the community infrastructure was set up um, in order to kind of connect with and tap into when needed during this time. I think that's an important part that folks don't um, elevate oftentimes and the dedicated resources put towards uh, equity were in place. And I have to quickly just jump in on that because that's such an important point. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, the health department convenes our community advisory board. Uh, Dr. Easterling, who's the head of that now um, at the health department. So Tori and I do this together and they, they inform our community-based approach directly by both convening and then offering us there. So I completely agree with you. I think, again, that's how we've been able to be successful is by getting the community voice through the health department. And Ms. J. Butler, I want to just uh, build on something Linda was saying about the community-based organizations, and that is, again, the role of community health workers who are based in that community. And if, if you'll forgive me for, again, using the model of the community health aid program in rural Alaska, Almost all of uh, the, the individuals that are in these uh, communities that are more than 90% uh, Alaska Native or American Indian are Alaska Native or American Indian themselves. And the majority are, if not from that very village, at least from the region. So they have a cultural competency that no one else would be able to bring to the equation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Alitha so and um, uh, Ted and others, what can be lifted quickly, given the urgency of the situation, from some of the work that um, uh, has been done? Um, uh, you, you said there was a lot of pre-work that made this more successful. If you had to extract a few things that might be transportable, what would those specifically be? I can start. <laughs> Um, I think that contact tracing needs to be started as a local effort. Um, I think you need to start by building trust and that starts by 
engaging your community and ideally doing what we did, which is actually hiring from your community. Um, I think that when you build from there, you should look at the other tools that you have in your tool belt. I think that there is some of the sort of mundane pieces of do you call, do you visit in person? Um, those are things to be worked out, but who is calling, who is visiting is the more important question. And then I think technology needs to be viewed as, um, I think this was nicely said, as a tool in your tool belt. Unto itself, it will not replace a trusted person in New York City that's gone through living in your community, the horrors that I saw on the front lines in March and April. There's no replacement for that. Um, at the same time, we can make it easier for people to engage with us and we can use technology as that enhancement uh, to build on top of the, of the base of trust that we've built. But I think it starts as a local effort. I think some of the uh, my response will, will tie into kind of um, Reed's um, initial question in terms of just you know trust at this time, especially as it relates to um, vaccine um, development as well as vaccine uh, distribution, um, and you know what is what is um, what is the opportunity at this moment in light of the majority of systems haven't taken kind of the effort. Um, prior to COVID really to, <clears throat> sorry, um, build this context of um, trust and networks with communities, whether through community-based organizations or community leaders. Um, I, I think, you know, it's very clear and most folks know, you know, the low rates already in terms of, as it relates to vaccine development of clinical trial participation um, amongst communities of color is very extremely low. Um, and really, framing again in the kind of lack of trustworthiness of institutions and really the question is you know for the institutions how do they become you know more trustworthy during this time what are the actions that need need to happen and i think ted has just elevated a few of them um, but also I, I think really critical and some of this work is starting to happen is calling upon the leaders who are very much connected to communities that are marginalized so as an example i'm, I'm with physicians so i'm going to talk about physicians but you know the National Medical Association um, that was created because they were excluded from the, the AMA um, in many years ago. But they now are convening and speaking with many stakeholders um, within this area. There are lots of convenings that are happening to be more intentional um, and strategic about what is it that needs to happen. How do we engage our trusted leaders and our trusted minds to be more involved in the development of strategy as it relates to um, the one of increasing folks within clinical participation, but ultimately what happens when vaccine is developed and, and how is that disseminated across this country? Um, <clears throat> and so I think that that's just one first step is, um, you know, making sure that if this is an area that you're working, whether you're a farmer or et cetera, that we are working better together collaboratively, um, but we are also centering those folks who are connected to or of those communities again that, that are centered. That's an opportunity that we actually do have now. Um, it is going to still be an uphill battle from my, my perspective um, because the trust issues are so heavy um, within our, with our communities um, at, at this point in time. I, I, Jonathan, I, this is, uh, Jonathan, this is Reed. I just wanted to quickly insert as you continue the flow that I just think that this is a critical point, and that is that, that Alita is making with the intersection of all these efforts, that each one, anytime there is an, a, an issue of distrust or bad behavior in any one of those sectors, whether it is the vaccine, clinical trials, dissemination, whether it is uh, the, the use of data, they bleed into each other and, 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 and one affects the other. So I think that this cautionary note about everyone needing to be clear that everything that we do has got to be so carefully done and so above reproach. Lastly, I would just indicate that if you see the National Academy of Medicine's recently released report on vaccine uh, dissemination and allocation, uh, that report took enormous efforts all through it to emphasize the importance of, of these kinds of issues and the importance of social equity. And so I would just hope that everybody would follow that model. Th thanks for letting me getting that in, uh, Jonathan. No, that was a perfect segue. I, I, I think trust um, is really the core issue. And um, you know, trust is lost quickly, gained slowly, and needed urgently. And um, that's a conundrum. Uh, and um, uh, your point, Reid, about um, the loss of credibility in one area um, related to COVID in a narrower sense, or related to public health 
uh, and uh, health services in the broader sense uh, is, is really challenging. And um, we've talked around um, uh, the mixed signals of, of, of the moment where our, our most esteemed institutions um, uh, are uh, under some duress on, uh, on them, uh, th this is a real issue. So um, I, I think we're searching for ways in which we can accelerate um, something that uh, under more ideal circumstances would be built um, uh, in a more um, uh, planned fashion as Aletha built in, in, in New York City Health Department um, in, in, in your tenure. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have that luxury. So how do we extract those things that can be extracted to um, uh, accelerate. Uh, um, uh, I don't know that's an answerable question, but I hope uh, amongst this esteemed panel that uh, you have some insights uh, into, uh, into that. Um, uh, even more specifically, when we begin to you know, contemplate the use of, of, of technology, um, uh, it, it, it gets not only at the, the obvious, um, you know, con uh, COVID um, uh, exposures, but um, uh, implicitly, if not explicitly, at other personal health information that's uh, usually protected. Um, what what um, are, are recommendations to accelerate both the building of trust and uh, as a, um, a corollary, recognizing it's only a tool in, in, in the, um, on, on the tool belt, um, the use of um, uh, both processes like um, uh, contact tracing as well as technologies um, uh, that might support that? I think we train our public health people and our, and our clinical people the wrong way. We train to not disclose the areas of uncertainty. We train people to speak authoritatively uh, in a community that already doesn't trust us. Uh, that's bad. I, I remember my parents before they passed, they, they looked me in the eye when they were discussing their health plans and they said, you know, Linda, we don't trust doctors and we haven't forgotten that you're one of them. So, so I don't think we should underestimate the extent to which mistrust exists. When, when around COVID-19 and other issues, I found that when I'm working specifically with either labor unions or community-based organizations, many of whom have known and worked with me for decades, that when you sit down with them and they're saying, why does this website say one thing and the other website say another thing? <clears throat> why is this true? If you reveal to them, if you say, this is how we normally do things, this is how, what this graph means, these are areas we don't yet know a real answer to, this is why this group thinks one way, this is why this group thinks another way. So don't underestimate the public in our communities. They're very sophisticated. They're capable of understanding where there's controversy. It takes time. The key thing is it takes time to invest, and now is the time to do it. Uh, we have a program working with the with, uh, citizens, for example, around cancer. And cancer, we call them citizen scientists out of the University of Illinois Cancer Center, where we spend a lot of time working with community groups and working with uh, lay people, uh, not health professionals, in explaining how we think about these things, why we think this way, and they often challenge us. So we have to be willing to say we don't know. We have to be willing to say this, these are areas of controversy. We have to be willing to let some of the inside baseball stuff that goes on in public health be exposed to the public so that they're able to judge when things are, are going well and when they're not, especially when we have national misdirection at the top. Just to add to Linda real quickly, or Dr. Murray, um, is we have to admit when we were wrong as well. I think as institutions who have experience with um, injustice oftentimes committed upon the, the neighborhoods and people that they have been serving, we have to, and, that, and I'm including any institution actually that I've probably worked at um, in that, um, that we have to admit also in Moran, because that's what's in the, the generational memory of folks. Th those are the things that people remember. And, you know, it might be not be an incident from long ago, somewhat long ago of Tuskegee, but it could be just more recent of what they experienced last week. And so those are the things that are on mind as, of people in that systems and as individuals within those systems, we have to acknowledge that. And I think oftentimes when we're asked to think about, you know, so what are the solutions? What are the quick solutions? I, I think to your point, John, this, this isn't a quick solution, um, but we have some things to move forward with and some steps that we can, can take at this time to start building trust in the immediate time. And it's as we would build trust with so many other folks, the way we communicate, how we communicate, I think what Dr. Murray is implying, um, it, you know, is, is not only communicating in a sense of transparency, but communicating often, 
giving people the information, answering questions, setting up those systems, making sure how we communicate is relevant and culturally responsive. Those are things that we can do, you know, at this point in time, understanding again that, you know, getting to that point of actually having trust, you know, is, is, is an uphill battle. I think for those comments, um, uh, the, the principle of consistent and, and, and frequent communication is one of the perennial public health um, uh, adages. Um, uh, it's clear we violated um, uh, the consistency and um, we're in a sort of media vortex where um, polarization uh, exacerbates um, uh, the, the underpinnings of that. Um, bringing it back um, uh, to the narrow, um, I welcome other thoughts uh, in terms of, um, uh, of the protection um, of mechanisms for um, uh, protecting not only personal health information, but um, um, if you think of COVID, uh, not, not only as the issue of the moment, but as a catalyst for change to achieve the sort of social justice, social equity that um, uh, is more desired uh, and um, the responsible, inclusive development and adoption of, um, uh, of, of technology, what needs to occur to uh, actually um, be able to simultaneously not only engender trust, but engender information that's absolutely essential to sort of providing a platform for more equitable outcomes, um, uh, particularly when you begin to get into information that relates to um, what we broadly call uh, the social determinants. Courtney, you look like you want to say something. I know you've done work in yeah, this area. I, yeah, I mean, I think this is definitely more narrow. I think the broader conversation is really the place to start. So I don't want to, to overstep that in any way. I would say from the healthcare system side of things, at least from safety net healthcare systems who are, who are probably have some trust with their communities based on how they've been operating and where, where their community-based uh, clinics are located, a lot is asked of them for digital technology on the implementation side. They have to then understand what the tool is. They have to understand the workflows. They have to um, provide support to patients to be able to use them and trust them themselves. And so I think, I think those, those types of things about workflows and implementation processes just can't be overlooked. Um, and when we think about the idea that we're gonna develop private solutions that might help us like with COVID or in other scenarios, um, the expertise of frontline providers, especially frontline providers who work in these communities and have been doing it, isn't really at the forefront, I would say, of how technology um, is developed. It's really secondary. And I think when they say, when it's sort of like trust, when, you, when they themselves, the healthcare leaders are saying that they don't have the time to evaluate the tool or to integrate it into their electronic health record, rather than say, oh, we're gonna move on to the next, the next place I can implement this, like really thinking about that in, in a hard way, I guess what I, what I would say to be able to do this differently because um, patients say over and over again that they won't use digital tools unless they think their doctor, their trusted doctor, a doctor that they have a relationship with wants them to. And so to me, we have to think about what, where are the relationships that have trust and how can we build on those rather than we'll start first in this health system over here because they have people willing and wanting to try out our tool and then it'll trickle down. I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it from my perspective. The, the floor is open. I just remind people, you know, I think we're being overly cautious in terms of Zoom etiquette, but um, I uh, really see a number of people who look like they want to just jump out of their seats. Dr. Ortega, you, you look um, primed for a response. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, John. And I think it's, I, I agree with many of the comments that have been made and uh, it goes, as was already stated by Dr. Murray and Dr. Maybank, but transparency is key. I think we have to be transparent in what we provide our patients. And so when we think about digital health privacy and information, we have to be transparent with what we are going to share and not share. And it's a balance because we're in a public health crisis. And so there is information that needs to be shared with the public and that we need to monitor, um, but at the same time, respect the rights of the patient. Um, and, and so I think it's gonna, as Dr. Maybank said, these solutions take time. And I think that we have to kind of be mindful of this at every step of the way so that we can make sure that we're taking everyone into consideration. Um, 
as was mentioned earlier, like having those key stakeholders early on is key. One of the things that we talked about were, was the narrative. And I think testimonials are really strong. Um, I think when you tell those personal stories and you share those patient encounters, it, it really just hits home. And then I, I think, especially when it's someone that's from your community that you recognize and that you understand, it's the same way as like, even as colleagues, we understand and recognize others' names and our networks. And we say, oh, I know a such and such individual. And so that becomes a trusted person. And I think having those um, key stakeholders and those individuals involved in every step of the process is important. Let me ask Emiliano uh, a question in this regard, um, because there are so many concerns that we have. And Emiliano, you, from the perspective of, of what your organization has been wonderfully serving the American society for a long time, uh, it, can we be too cautious and never get out of the box? Can we make the enemy of the good the perfect? Are you guys, uh, Emiliano, at, at a place where you think you can that we can have some positive things that we can build on and go forward? Or do we have to really worry about everything and then and not make progress? How do you see that balance? Uh, thank you, Reid. Uh, so I think that there is a balance, of course. Uh, but, but hoping on what uh, Dr. Ortega was mentioning, uh, I think a transparency is important, of course, but also there should be substantive safeguards. Uh, uh, for, for the information, right? The information has to be protected and there has to be enforcement mechanisms so that when a contact tracer calls me and I tell him whatever I was doing, I have to be sure that that person is not going to share that information and I have to have a mechanism by which if that person shares that information, I can do something about it. Because if we are only um, saying that uh, all these like information sharing practices we've seen all these like all these agencies and all these like public government agencies that have all these information sharing practices but in but in fact they don't uh, comply with them and and why is this because there is no enforcement like the people don't have any uh, way to like uh, actually enforce all these practices for various reasons uh, from legal reasons to policy reasons, but, but at the end of the day, we need people to be sure that they can do something about it. And as to what you were mentioning uh, about the, uh, the, the progress, of course, progress ha uh, can be made, but uh, what, what, what I was trying to say with this like tech solutionism is like, we don't always have to go for technology for solutions, right? Because sometimes all this, this technology is forced upon us and, and people don't really have the, the chance. Sometimes it's better to have like this like team of analog contact tracers as, as Dr. Long was mentioning from the community, calling the people building trust instead of relying in an app that of course can, if, like of course an app can like scale the work, right? But, but what's the cost for that? Like the, the figures Dr. Long showed are like I was I was shocked when I saw this, those figures. I didn't know I didn't know those figures. It's like it's like all these people like actually complying with the quarantine with the quarantine and with the self isolation. Like how uh, how can these same uh, figures be achieved using an app? Especially especially when all this trust and, and political issues are around, right? Some people don't even want to wear a mask. So we are there. Right? Some people refuse to wear a, mark, a mask when they go to Target. So, so how can we expect, first of all, them to download the app and then to do what the app says them to do? And this is on, on one side. And on the other side, all these, these, these people from marginalized communities will, are actually like fearing of losing their jobs. We heard cases where, where, where some workplaces close if there is a, 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 if there is a, if there is a positive case. So, so I think that all this should be taken into the discussion of what progress looks like, right? Uh, what is progress? Progress is having more technology? Uh, I, I don't think so. I personally don't think that, that more technology means it, it's a positive thing it, it, if it doesn't have a real uh, purpose and, and a social goal, right? right? Great, great thought. Thank you. I, I, others will will go forward, and Jonathan's continue to moderate. I, I would just say though, and I and I and I'm learning from everything you are saying. But the one thing I'm I'm also thinking about as you are speaking, is at part of our conversation, and 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 certainly me as an old old person, uh, older than I can hardly stand sometimes, um, is that the we make it seem as if the technology that people are having with these apps and these conversations is something extraordinary. 
the and that there's this wonderful uh, loveliness that we have this nostalgia for individuals having face to face contact but 90% of people's conversations these days is digital so i mean it's almost as if you know we're 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 thinking that we're grafting on some new thing on top of the world what happens when you look at this through the prism that the normal way i communicate with people is through digital technology that's my life therefore uh, let's make this more seamless with the norm of how I live my life, as opposed to this being something that is extraordinary. Thanks, Reid. I think that's an incredibly important point. Um, uh, I just um, think about my kids' um, interaction with the world in particular, uh, and um, that digital interface is, correct, is extraordinary. And uh, in the moment, uh, you know, while I expected my um, graduate school age kids to um, uh, take to things like telehealth, my 95-year-old father has also uh, adopted. Now he's fortunate to have the, the technology and the broadband access, uh, et cetera, but uh, generationally that may not have been entirely um, uh, predicted. Let's pivot a little bit. We're talking about really trust and, and, and technology, and um, I think great points have been made about the institutions that are trusted having a central role. Uh, and one of the institutions I think we have to contend with, um, uh, and it sort of ties together the point about um, uh, the economic disruption, Miliano, that you've made uh, in terms of misapplication is the relationship with employers. So Ted Long, um, uh, as you think about um, potential um, uh, partners, um, how, how did you all contemplate the um, relationship with employers and um, as technologies emerge, um, uh, is there a role for um, uh, the employer? Does that um, uh, enhance or exacerbate trust? Um, uh, interested in, in, in how your team thought about the, the, this issue and the lessons that might um, translate forward to um, uh, advancing the um, responsible use of technology? Yeah, I'll start. I'll premise this by saying that, that um, I think we're at a preliminary stage for the exact question you're asking about how employers relate to the use of technology. What I will say is that for, from a contact tracing perspective, we've really built our program from the base of person-to-person -person interaction. Both you as an individual or on the phone with the contact tracer and everything you say is completely confidential. We aren't telling your employer what you say or anything like that. And then as you identify contacts, they're individuals that you have potentially exposed to the coronavirus when you were contagious. We reach out to your contacts. Again, everything is completely confidential under a city health code. So we've come at it from the angle of really keeping this on the individual to individual interaction in terms of how we use contact tracers. The other piece is we do look at facilities. If we see more than one case in a facility, we aren't sharing the names, but we will go to the facility to do an investigation. And this is where the Department of Health comes in, why we are in lockstep at all times to see if there is transmission going on in that facility, be it a school, be it a business, be it a gym. Um, right now, our technology is only on the individual level for the app. So we haven't gone, again, we just started this last week. So um, it's still a little bit early with us, but just wanted to drive the point home that as, in, as, as it pertains to employers, We've, the base we've built for contact tracing, which is a base that trust is the cornerstone of, has been on the individual level with everything kept completely confidential. So this is one of the real problems we have in public health and uh, that Dr. Frieden said, you know, this is one method. Um, so I'm very, this not against New York City, but I'm very disturbed at our sort of traditional slow individual by individual approach. Here in Chicago, for example, where we had some outbreaks in, in workplaces, uh, when I checked with my colleagues in, in public health, uh, they were not tracking. It was not easy for them to track where people worked. But I would argue, just like we do clinically as a physician, that, that you know, last year I could have sat down and pre predicted what locations a, a, a virus like this would spread jails, dorms, uh, nursing homes, uh, what, what kind of work location. So it's not a surprise to us in health and safety, occupational health and safety, that meatpacking plants, I could list a bunch of other places, are a major nexus of outbreaks. And so, and the problem here is not just that there are a lot of cases there, but these are places that seed the furthering of, of the virus. So one problem I have is that we have focused if I can speak frankly for a moment, we focus really on our experience with sexually transmitted infections, individual by individual. We're still used to a very relatively slow rate of passage and generations of cycles in passing any infectious disease. This is airborne. We, we could predict, we could predict that 
uh, subways and buses are going to be major areas of spread, and we have not acted aggressively on that information. Um, and, and so, and I don't think you need digital tools. I think they might be helpful, but you don't need digital tools to predict that and to get on those and to go in ahead of time and ask yourself what's going on in these essential workplaces. How can we make them safer? Let's track. Let's have a surveillance system that tracks intelligently where we think the pandemic is going to spread. Yeah, and this is such to weigh in on that real fast. I think that is a really important point. And what, what we've done in New York City, at least, which I think is that might be a helpful lesson for others, is to your point, we've taken certain types of facilities and grouped them together in terms of our response. So I'll give you the example of schools. So in schools, we have a situation room. Anytime there's somebody with a positive case in the entire school, the situation room gets, that, gets the case looks into it, and if there's more than one case, we have a decisive rule that the school is going to go into remote learning for 24 hours while we do our investigation. But we know going into the school year that schools are an area where we want to have a particular focus because people are going to be close together. So our situation room turns these things around in a matter of hours, and it's sort of that, it's, to me, it's that, that having that, planning that piece ahead, because if we didn't do that, and you have a couple of cases at a school, it could be very... <laughs> it could deteriorate very quickly. So we're able to have that communication with both families and teachers in the school uh, to be able to make adjudication decisions decisively. But to your point, if we were purely on the individual level, we wouldn't have done that and we wouldn't have had our situation room. And I think that's actually been one, or probably our secret ingredient for how our schools are open now. So I agree with you on that. And I, I want to chime in also, hoping on what Dr. Murray was mentioning, like all this that, that's what I was saying, like technology should not be an end on itself, it should have a supporting role, right? Like take all this knowledge, like Dr. Murray was mentioning that she would have been able to predict, right, where all, the, all these outbreaks were going to be. Well, let's use technology with that input in the background. Let's not just like roll out any technology. Let's have an input from public health specialists that they are the best ones that are situated right now to tell us what to do and let's create and let's let's uh, create a technology that suits <laughs> them instead of them suiting the technology so i want right? to pivot off of that point you know in in healthcare despite the limitations of electronic records we had a revolution it was called meaningful use it it moved us from paper to computer uh, and the journey is not completed on the other hand um, I, I had the privilege of uh, actually chairing a um, Robert Wood Johnson sponsored initiative with Resolve um, a few years back and um, didn't realize that among the, um, you know, 14,000 different public health entities, we don't have a meaningful use equipment. We don't have standards of interoperability. Uh, and in fact, when you get down to state and local health departments, some are operating not only on antiquated systems, but I suspect there are people on this um, uh, call not old enough to remember Lotus Notes. Some are doing their surveillance through Lotus Notes. Um, what are your, what's your guidance in terms of creating a public health information infrastructure? What lessons um, um, from foot in the camp of healthcare might you draw in terms of what was right about the meaningful use um, and what you do differently in terms of um, uh, inspiring uh, public health 2.0 or 3.0 in terms of the, the integrated information architecture that would allow, um, uh, you know, Dr. Murray's insights as to, okay, here's where, you know, the susceptible environments are in the second order, here's where those people transit, um, you know, via subway, and here's the third order, here's where they live. Um, what, what are your recommendations in terms of next steps? If you were advising, um, and, um, you know, re regardless of, of, of outcome, there'll be a, a, a next administration. If you were advising the Secretary of Health and Human Services, what to do in terms of um, uh, public health informatics 2.0, what, what would you say? Um, is that a question for me? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, it, it is a question oh. for um, uh, the group broadly. And um, by way of um, trying to take our, our, our collective insights, our capacity to convene, uh, and um, I, I want to say for the record, from an organization with the credibility to call out misrepresentation uh, of science, uh, an organization, National Academy of Medicine, or Victor Zell, um, uh, at personal and professional risk, took very clear statements on social equity, and I think that preserves credibility. So I think we have this extraordinary platform here and the intellect of the combined groups. This question is open to, to everyone. What would you advise the next Secretary of Health and Human Services in terms of uh, the necessary the essential upgrades to um, 
uh, public health information systems. This isn't my, my primary area of expertise, but I'll say at least the experience in San Francisco um, that I have been peripherally involved in is that the, the healthcare systems sit on a large amount of data from their electronic health records and to not recreate the wheel for meaningful use is sort of my standpoint, but to be better about the sharing of the data and the building on top of those infrastructures to allow public health departments to have more information at their fingertips. For example, um, they already share data securely and privately about things like um, sexually transmitted infections, and yet the public health department in San Francisco doesn't know the entire chronic disease risk of the city. Um, and, COVID, you know, and, and so we're doing better data sharing with COVID than perhaps we were doing before more real time between the healthcare systems, EHRs, and the central command at the Department of Public Health. But can we use that as an infrastructure to go forward rather than um, you know, allowing each uh, the business um, uh, interest of each healthcare system DHR data to be siloed. Um, and I think that's where a lot of these health information exchanges from my very external view have had some problems. Um, but we have a lot of infrastructure now. Can we make it sure that it's interoperable and built on that rather than starting over again um, and, and really doing the investment well from that side? Great. Jonathan, okay. it sure seems to me that we Reid, go ahead then, Urs. Oh, we'll go to you next. Uh, Reid, go ahead. Reid, I think you froze. So yeah, we'll go to Urs, and when you get um, uh, broadband back, we'll come back to you. Uh, Urs? Thank you. Uh, just building up on these comments, uh, we, we have done a, a lot of work actually on, on interoperability, and one of the main lessons from that uh, work and research uh, across different uh, industries and, and spheres of life was that we tend to focus on the technology. So it's essentially a Emiliano 2.0 story. Um, and that matters a lot. Of course, we need to think about um, how different systems and technical infrastructures and components of systems and apps can work together. That's super important. That being said, quite often, some of the barriers um, uh, with respect to systems and organizations working together come at different layers where we usually don't pay um, enough attention to. So there is an organizational layer. Think about different workflows uh, that may or may not actually um, help with interoperability uh, for data flows across systems and turning that data into meaningful action. Uh, there is also often a, a layer of interoperability around policies, whether it's internal policies or whether it's laws and regulations that may create barriers for the better working together uh, across systems. Um, and then there is, I think, ultimately also an important human layer uh, and the mindset issue uh, as we are discussing today, right? We're still organized in our minds in silos. That's also the way we're trained and the point of education was made, made previously. And how, we, um, how do we uh, educate uh, more interoperable mindsets? Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, advice number one, not to reduce interoperability to a question of technical standards and software interoperability and data formats. That's super important, don't get me wrong but um, there are more layers to this interop story that we need to keep in mind. And that, if I may add just a second comment, um, I'm also wondering, as you asked, what do we tell the, you know, uh, to, the, to the health uh, ministry um, or department, I'm also wondering whether one of the main lessons learned uh, looking at what's happening right now with COVID, it, is that this is a perfect compounded crisis. Yes, of course, it's a public health crisis, but at the same time, it's an economic crisis, it's a social justice crisis, it's an educational crisis, it's an environmental crisis. It's all of these things simultaneously. And I do wonder, you know, where, um, what's the person to talk to? What's the jurisdiction? Uh, uh, in, in legal terms uh, that should be in charge in some sort of uh, working towards a preparedness for a next crisis, given this compound nature uh, of what we're experiencing right now. And to me, that's perhaps the biggest design challenge 
uh, when it comes also to government reform and thinking about how we work together uh, on these big societal challenges and COVID being a, a, a big real time case study, but there are others, whether you take climate or, or any of the other big challenges for society had. And, and to me, that's, uh, that's perhaps um, the biggest question uh, uh, coming out of, of what we're experiencing right now. So just uh, to make the big problem even bigger, thank you. No, 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 that, those are great comments that um, uh, your, your point about the organizational layer being siloed, that our human interpretation of that is also siloed. I love the concept of the interoperable mindset. Uh, and the need for a coordinating function that supervenes. With that, let me go to Reed Tuxen. Thank you. I'm glad you're uh, back online. Well, actually, thank you. I'm sorry that I lost the internet connection, but I wanted to just ask you, Jonathan, and maybe others, um, this issue of the um, ability of the, the role of the office of the national coordinator. Uh, we often uh, in our meetings uh, have, uh, of the Digital Learning Collaborative, have representation from ONC. And I'm wondering if, 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 if there's anybody on the line uh, from there who could send us or drop us a note, but also Jonathan, your sense of, do you see any meaningful progress from where you've been on integrating public health data into the clinical data uh, so that these, these will flow uh, a, a lot better? Because it just continues to look like a lot of the public health kinds of things that, that Courtney was describing and, and what she made me think about. Um, uh, you know, are things that have been talked about for a while, but we haven't seemed to make as much progress as we want it. But maybe you have a better view of it. Yeah. Have I seen the, the, the real integration of public health data into the sort of domain con um, uh, really circumscribed health system? Yes and no. So, um, for all the reasons Urs mentioned, this is a multidimensional crisis that has um, raised the specter of social injustice uh, in very stark terms. Uh, and that has compelled, um, I think, a lot of action to seek in an active sense, not um, sort of passively wait um, for acquisition of, uh, of data from community in a way that um, has frankly not been motivated um, adequately before. I'm not sure that it's fully motivated yet, but uh, I have noticed a start there. At a technical level, there, there's a challenge, um, uh, and um, uh, you know, to, to the hierarchy that Urs just described, um, I, I, I think there's interest. There, there is um, uh, that there is difficulty in actually um, uh, either acquiring, um, sharing, uh, or, or um, uh, those data ultimately uh, consuming those data in a way that's decisional, both for um, individual that is the the, the, the person, the patient. Uh, uh, consuming uh, from a public health standpoint, as has been discussed, or consuming um, uh, from a health system standpoint. Um, uh, so if, if there's any from ONC, you know, please jump in. But uh, this is one of the reasons I raised the specter of the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services, not ultimately as the Secretariat of Healthcare Delivery, but the yeah. Secretariat that joins health and care, and frankly, emphasizes health, um, given uh, the, the platform that current circumstances have created. So my optimism rests uh, on, on the stark circumstances, really compelling change. Um, my um, uh, uh, hesitancy rests on the absence of, uh, of progress to date uh, for the reasons mentioned. Thank you. And I think that the hesitancy as it continues is I, I feel if folks are, if the systems or the sides of public health and healthcare are not proximate to one another, um, literally, you know, if they're not existing right now and working in, cl in close collaboration and coordination, I think H plus H is raising an example with contact tracing, you know, health and public health and healthcare are coming closer together. But is that happening with all the work that they're doing at this time? And I, I won't comment on that, but my experience was particularly no. So I, being in the healthcare side, I think there are just so many, again, I go back to the narrative and the understanding and the lack of understanding about what public health even is and means and what it does, what the system looks like, how it's set up, how it's organized is part of that barrier. And so ways in which um, HHS, whomever it is, can encourage um, more proximity of these two entities together in, in meaningful ways, I think is going to be helpful. So as an example, 
Um, I think about Chicago where Dr. Murray is and where headquarters of AMA is. And I look at like West Side United as an example of you know, a community driven effort um, of which you have six healthcare anger institutions um, that are a part of the effort. The health department's at the table, the mayor's office is at the table. So what, what it does is just at least set up an opportunity for those conversations to happen to support getting to the point of interoperability. But I feel if people are not proximate to one another and are not having conversations with each other, it's really hard to get to that point. And our systems aren't set up to really encourage that overall and the policies. So whatever policies can do to support that, I think is a good direction to go. I think those are terrific points. Yeah, I, I, I'll just share. I want to come back to Courtney Lyle's comment that um, you know one place to begin is by the formal healthcare infrastructure with the data it holds. Sharing those data, I, I mentioned um, in passing that we've cared for sixty thousand COVID positive inpatients. Um, it's going it, to. It is my desire to make in a de-identified fashion those data available so there's an acceleration of understanding the, the course of COVID and uh, effectiveness of treatments. Um, there are not mechanisms to share those data. Um, there are, in some of the questions that came in, there are concerns about um, some of the relationships with big tech uh, as, as an example. Um, there are also privacy concerns and believe it or not, it's massively expensive to um, um, uh, functionally de-identify uh, data. Um, um, and, and so those are some things that we're, we're working through on the order of um, you know, seven figures to de-identify a, a, a data set for um, uh, usability. You know, and, um, uh, I, I think these are some of our immediate opportunities. Now we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna make those data available to a certain set of researchers, but um, uh, I, I wish I could tell you it was easy. I wish I could tell you it was the derivative of the system, uh, but I think those are the things that um, really, um, uh, you know, Michael, you began to outline in terms of the aspirations um, for a digital commons where, Courtney, the data that are extant can be utilized uh, as a public good to accelerate understanding. Um, let, let's um, take a, a final sweep here through, and um, I, I want to pick up on one, one, one last question. Anybody who wants to um, uh, to comment on this, the issue of health literacy. Um, uh, the comment came in, uh, really, I think an implication that it's bi-directional and we haven't done that adequate job with education broadly. I, I think um, uh, there's no one on this group who would um, uh, disagree with um, uh, the injustices of um, uh, uh, unequal uh, education, educational opportunity. Uh, but um, uh, as a component of what's even been prescribed, we're, we're deficient in, uh, in, in health literacy. Um, we have a moment where health literacy is is, is needed. Uh, and any thoughts on how, as a, a principle that would support the trust necessary to advance um, uh, technology, um, where would you begin uh, in terms of health literacy, particularly as it relates to, um, uh, to, to not only the um, uh, pandemic, but um, to the use of technology in the pandemic? I think the real problem we have with health literacy is in the side of the professionals. You know, uh, the people who are really illiterate about what makes people healthy are, are our health systems and our public health systems. So when we say things like stay home if you're sick and we don't understand that most people in this country that work for an hourly wage do not have paid sick days, that's a problem of us understanding basic information and basic literacy. To me, the challenge is always to have physicians, for example, learn how to listen to their patients, public health leaders learn how to listen to the community. When we do that, when we become literate ourselves on what really keeps people healthy or makes them sick, then we're able to say intelligent things to people like, let's put in some rent control so that you don't get evicted because you're sick for a couple of months. Or we paid for care, for, let's talk about COVID. We paid for COVID treatment. People were discharged from the hospital. They required home oxygen. There was no mechanism to pay for that home oxygen. So we didn't listen and, and we committed malpractice because we didn't listen to what patients needed and we didn't act in a certain way. So, so I think that I would start with the health professionals, the policy walks, et cetera, have them sit down in the real world on the streets with people and listen carefully and you will hear what's needed to stop this pandemic. If only. I also want to mention something about this, which is that health, like 
literacy is directly related to the creation of the conditions, the material conditions for people to have access. For example, here in the city of Boston, there are some, some parts where almost 30% of households don't have broad, broadband access. So if we, if we, we have to take this into account when we are rolling up a new technology. So I, I heard this uh, today in these amazing panels, uh, this uh, need for a broadband access from, a, for example, municipal broadband access provided by the, by the government, right? This is what we need. So we have to create these conditions so that people can be literacy, like people can acquire this, 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 all this understanding of technology, but people have to have technology first. So, so this should be part of the discussion, right? How do we create the material conditions for people to become literate in technology? As Jonathan goes around and, and asks uh, all of you for these closing comments, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling in my mind to sequence um, what Tom Frieden said this morning about, and so many of you have emphasized, is it's still about boots on the street. It's still about hand-to-hand -hand work at the grassroots level. And that without that, you don't get to have suddenly magical technological solutions. What I'm, as you all start to close out, if any of you have any thoughts to, to how to guide uh, the National Academy uh, on where do we recommend making investments? So where does this society put its money? Um, and you know, the National Academy has another set of committees on the future of public health, and it's looking at the public health infrastructure. Jonathan and I are looking at it through the prism of, of digital technologies. Um, mature leaders have to make tough decisions. So I hope that you all will, uh, as you comment on whatever else is on your mind, if you have any guidance for, for the National Academy around where do you put your priorities? Is it either or? Is it both? Is it a zero sum game? Um, I'm really interested to see how you would uh, think through that uh, as John leads us through this closing uh, round robin. Let's use that as our framing for indeed the, the, the final thoughts on, uh, for this group and then we'll try to, to, to draw some conclusions out. So. Well, let me, um, I'm gonna go around my screen and um, uh, sequentially um, uh, and um, let me start um, uh, with um, uh, Dr. Ortega. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. I think um, with those comments that were made, I agree wholeheartedly with a lot of the things that have been said. And my comments in for the HSS or for what we should do in the next steps is, one, we've already declared that technology is a social determinant of health. And we need to provide either broadband access or um, devices to our communities. But I also think that, and we've discussed this several times, but technology is a spectrum. And we need to meet our patients and our community where they are on that spectrum and then try to work to get them to the optimal care or the optimal health that we possibly can be. There are patients who I engage with who prefer phones, even though they have smartphone technology, they prefer the phone call, or some patients may not be in a situation where they can uh, be in a video because of their home environment um, and prefer to text message because it's a safer uh, avenue for them to reach a healthcare provider. And so I think that we need to meet our patients where they are with regards to that, and then support all those different technologies as modes to communicate with our patients. I think we've already made the, uh, another comment as to technology is not going to replace physicians and that interaction that we have with our patients, but it's going to supplement and complement it, right? And so it should be an enhancer and we should work um, in doing so. And I think that, um, and you brought up this comment and it's been brought up as well, but just that data should go both ways. It shouldn't just be the patients providing data to the healthcare providers, but also healthcare providers providing patients the data, but I mean, data to patients, but also that data going to public health entities. As you mentioned earlier, it's extremely challenging and cumbersome to get your personal healthcare information to public health officials that need it in a crisis. Um, and we've seen that in different set, and every state has had different ways of handling every city and we need to come up with a more uniform way of doing so but also educating our public. When you made the comment earlier about employers, I think that there's, and um, Ted, you have a great response to the New York City schools, but I think we need to do that for our employees. When I look at businesses now, every business handles uh, contact tracing and different uh, COVID activities in 
very different manners. I think we need to have a unified form or at least a location where as a business owner or an employer, you can say, hey, let me go to this website or let me go seek this information and get standards of care for how I should be engaging with my employees, but also any consumer or customers that engage with our business. Um, so I think that those are key things that will help us kind of move forward and we should be mindful of. Great, thanks. Uh, Courtney Lyles? Yeah, I think I'll be brief. I, I think I fully agree. I, I think the fundamental challenges of broadband access and device ownership that relate to digital skills and the ability to use devices is, is fundamental. Um, and because everyone should have the choice to do it, and then they should be able to choose the preferences that they and their needs based on what they think they need in their everyday life. And we're not there yet. Um, so we need to be first focusing on that. And the, the way I think about it for the National Academy um, would be to think about um, including this in the in the suite of social referrals and in the suite of things that we think about and uh, giving more resources and attention to the community-based organizations um, who are working on digital uh, skills and access the same way that we think about food and housing and to make sure that we're thinking about them both for the training and skills but also for the development of new technologies in the future. Great, thank you so much. Emiliano. Thank you. Uh, what, what I would say is that um, I, I would advise the people, uh, the people in power to actually listen to scientists and public health experts and just see what they need and just see what is needed to prevent the spread of coronavirus or of any other communicable disease, right? Public health surveillance is it's important uh, but, but, and should be warranted. And all this data collection should have a goal, a clear goal, which should be set up by, by public health experts and scientists, right? So I, I cannot stress this enough. Uh, technology should not uh, be made. So, so public health experts should not sue the technology available. The technology should be constructed and designed and coded in accordance to what public health experts need and say it's needed to prevent the, the, the this, this type of outbreaks and to combat epidemics or pandemics. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Murray. Yes, I, I guess my answer would be where should we put our money would be in, into working differently. So, so if we start off with let's talk about COVID-19, we could talk about chronic disease, pick the topic. I think some of the principles that were outlined at the very beginning in terms of patient-centered and, and uh, accountable and all that kind of transparency, I think what we really need to concentrate today on is involving as many different sectors I don't just mean healthcare, like clinical and public health, it's transportation, as many different sectors as we possibly can to center equity at the center of our principles so that we're always striving to increase how much equity we have in our society. I think making sure that we involve the people that are being acted upon, uh, you know, whether that's who's riding the L or whether it's who's coming to the, to the health center. So I think, uh, something like the National Academy can put its emphasis on beginning to work differently. These are complicated, difficult problems to solve. They're going to require comprehensive solutions. And so one of the tasks in the short term future is to teach people and leaders how to begin to think and operate uh, whatever program they're talking about in a different manner. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Urs Gasser. Thank you so much. I, I would love to uh, build up on the comments uh, by Dr. Murray, actually. Um, we've talked about technology as some sort of an app, as a product, as, a, as an outcome. But I think there is another uh, version to look at technology, which is very much related to what Dr. Murray just described. And that is how technology enables us to work together. And I would say there is a positive version of it that enables new forms of collaboration, um, co-design approaches, innovation at the edges, building things bottom up, see how they work, start small, start with minimal, minimal viable products and scale it up if it works in a given context, build in these learnings as we move forward. And so I'm encouraged by the conversation. We, we rightly so have focused very much on system level changes because we understand the systemic and, and system level uh, challenges we are confronted with and discuss today. I would just add maybe there is a version in this crisis that we also look very closely to the bottom up innovation that happens. That's probably more around social innovations than technological innovations. 
and how can we leverage those and and build it bottom up if it's so hard to change some of these hard legacy uh, policies and systems top down maybe um, at least as a complementary strategy we can also push and learn bottom up um, so i stop there thank you thank you very very much uh, ted long Yes, thank you again for uh, your time, everybody. Today has been a fascinating panel to be a part of and a, a privilege and honor to join you all. Um, I would just actually reflect on what a few people have said so far. I think all the important thoughts in my mind are captured. Technology is an enhancement, it is not an end unto itself. It needs to be guided from the bottom up and involve the people that it's acting on to serve the people that it's acting toward. Um, and we need national leadership to do that. Um, we need national leadership to prioritize building trust with our communities, and we need national leadership to then uh, be able to prioritize um, in terms of how you get to that trust, uh, the different ways we could use technology so we don't all feel like we're creating a one-off here, um, but we actually have, we're all, we all know we're going in the same direction with the same principles um, and use technology to support and uphold that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Alita Mebank, uh, you, you're up. So I think, you know, for me, I, I'm in agreement with what everyone has said, but um, a couple of things. I guess, you know, based on my conversation and my presentation, you know, I think for the National Academy for your, with your national platform, we still need folks and institutions to still name the impact of systems of power and exclusion um, and how they impact all aspects of digital health um, and, and the work that we do around it, whether it's in process, or an outcome um, as it relates to device access, connectivity, digital literacy, design relevance, as well as aspects of the healthcare delivery system. We still need to name the root causes of why these inequities exist and we need to still call attention to centering equity, but move deeper than just saying it's equity, it's unjust, but we have to look at the power of in our historical context of how we got here in the first place. If, if we don't call that out, I just, I see us having the same problems and the same um, issues as we move forward in trying to create change and trying to, again, advance um, equity. And I really think there should be a, a really great focus on just the design relevance um, and the design aspects of um, digital work. There's not as much conversation around um, ensuring that there are equitable opportunities within the context of design. So some of it was mentioned in terms of you know, who are people listening to who are, who are um, creating the designs? Are they in contact with patients? I think somebody mentioned about physicians, you know, are they part of this decision making as it relates to innovative um, solutions? Are patients a part of the decision making? I think the design relevance piece is really critical to elevate. And then in order to do that, I agree with Dr. Murray in bringing different collaboratives or, or different folks together um, and, and using your power to excuse me, to convene, to bring better together public health, the private sector, all these different folks that we know are stakeholders are important to achieving optimal health. Um, and, I, and, and not for the sake of just bringing these folks together who have good ideas, I think we need to bring folks together so that they can learn more about each other and what they're doing and their context to how they come to their work and their agendas so that we can have um, better um, cross collaborative work. Uh, and it, that kind of pushes us all to think through new designs and new ways of being and, and how we do our work. Um, that's fine. Yeah, fantastic. And um, I, I have a confession to make. You really weren't the last one on my um, screen, Aletha, uh, but I was hoping you'd come back to that because I honestly think that is the organizing principle um, that the systems of power that um, uh, would ultimately inform um, not only, and I think our, our conversation divided into two components, the technology, uh, and um, to, to use Earth's term, the, the social innovation that's um, uh, necessary. So I think um, we, we have two distinct themes that have um, arisen, um, uh, that um, there has to be access to technology as a prerequisite for health li literacy, um, uh, but also for health um, uh, equity. Um, uh, that there, there are some very literal manifestations of that access to broadband device uh, as well as the uh, skills. Uh, but um, uh, the, the larger context is really an issue of culture, uh, one in which science has to be valued, 
uh, one, one in which um, uh, really systems level of thinking occurs, one in which social innovation uh, is um, a, a catalytic and one in which um, trust is developed through interactions um, with the people who are uh, affected by the decisions uh, and um, uh, that they are not only included, uh, but designs are relevant um, uh, because of, uh, of, of their inclusion and the application consequently more successful. Uh, and so I come back to, to, to the point that I think the organizing principle uh, is, um, uh, is, is the, the system of power. Um, uh, and um, in my, my mind, if I were to um, uh, pull a lever, I, I think it is uh, really um, uh, the sort of financial systems that um, reward or uh, don't reward um, uh, certain behaviors uh, as uh, a mechanism uh, to, to move things forward. Um, I, I know uh, that the National Academies team um, will uh, contemplate uh, far more deeply all of um, our comments, but let me thank uh, all of the panelists for um, uh, their terrific insights and now to um, really help to synthesize this and for his own inputs. Uh, let me turn back to um, uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Reed Tuxen and uh, Michael McGinnis. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And as I, uh, again, a, a, a terrific uh, uh, set of congratulations to all the panelists who have really put this together for us. Uh, I, I think that we have some, some challenges uh, that we need to address and an opportunity to do that. The one thing that I hope that uh, I would leave all of our panelists with and also the almost 100 people that are still online uh, in, in this, what has turned out to be a very popular uh, session uh, is that um, the, the, the seriousness of purpose of the National Academy uh, to think about these issues and make meaningful recommendations uh, going forward. Um, I, I have to say that I have been very impressed by Mike McGinnis and the team uh, as they listen carefully to these deliberations and then integrate them across uh, the full spectrum of the National Academy of Medicine's portfolio. And so I think that that's what has happened today. Uh, we have clearly indicated that uh, this is not an easy siloed conversation. It bleeds into multiple elements. And I think that that, that becomes very important then uh, to, to, to recognize all the places that it touches uh, and then be able to make uh, serious recommendations. So uh, you've, you've advanced the ball forward for us, but quite frankly, um, uh, there are some challenging questions that we have to deliberate uh, to get the right, uh, the, the right sizing of this. And, um, and so I'm sure that Mike will talk about uh, the process uh, going forward. And so I'll just add my thanks uh, to, to Jonathan's for, for all the panelists. Well, thank you, uh, Reed and Jonathan and e each of the commenters. This has been an extraordinarily rich and inspiring uh, set of conversations. Um, we started out with a focus on um, the issue of um, how our digital infrastructure can be enhanced to uh, improve our, our societal efforts to, to control the COVID um, pandemic. Um, but clearly in the course of the conversation, the lessons that we heard are generalizable uh, for all of our digital strategies in, in, in many ways. Um, and um, uh, it, it underscores uh, Reed, the point that uh, Reed just made about uh, the uh, difficulty, the challenges we have, but they are um, identifiable and engageable if we have uh, the ability to, um, uh, to work together. Uh, in the course of the conversation, I was just jotting down the words that I heard um, uh, repeatedly um, uh, offered and um, uh, somewhat arbitrarily, but not entirely, uh, pick uh, the 10 that I, um, that I heard the most. Uh, broadband, connectivity, open, devices, equity, narrative, community, security, trust, uh, and action. Uh, clearly the notion of broadband, universal broadband um, is the starting point uh, for uh, our engagement uh, in a sustained fashion of the challenges that were uh, discussed today. Uh, the notion of connectivity uh, referenced to our connectivity with each other uh, and our connectivity, um, uh, uh, the connectivity, the analytic capacity required for data sharing and, and, um, and progress that gives us a stronger foundation. Uh, the notion of open uh, uh, was referenced both with respect to open access uh, 
and open source. Um, and, and Tom Frieden mentioned, uh, in fact, the uh, desirability of an alternative set of open source approaches if uh, we are unable to uh, get where we need to with the notion of uh, common standards and, and, and guidelines. But it's clearly a, a critical issue for us for the kind of progress necessary. On devices, um, uh, um, a lot of discussion on that and clearly um, uh, until we have end user appropriate devices uh, and therefore the ability to put power in the hands of the individuals, uh, we're gonna be cut short of the kind of uh, progress that's, that's possible. Equity, um, it, it is the most painful lesson that we've learned in the last several months. Uh, and um, I hope that we as a society have, uh, are, have learned it and are beginning to really uh, act on that uh, learning process. It's priority number one. Aletha in uh, her reference to the uh, 10 essential services and the revision process had equity squarely in the middle. That's where it has to be. Um, and, um, uh, and, the, and the narrative um, that is used uh, in, uh, by society uh, that reflects the culture in which we make our decisions is critical to uh, achieving uh, that equity. A community is where we start and where we finish with respect to um, our motivation and, and our ability to make a difference. Uh, the community voice has to be the first voice, uh, and it has to be um, the, uh, the, the common uh, guide that, that drives us if we're going to make um, the kind of progress that, uh, that's possible. You know, we, we love the dazzling technology, and, you know, each of us uh, being a digital aficionado of one sort or another knows that until uh, the digital uh, um, uh, resources uh, speak to the community and listen to the community in the way that's possible. We're not going to make the progress that we should. Uh, security. Um, Linda uh, mentioned um, don't underestimate the public. Um, and until, uh, and we need to listen to the public and engage the public first and foremost on the security front, because no matter how many approaches we have, security isn't going to matter. Uh, in a technical sense, uh, unless people feel that it's secure. And that gets to obviously the issue of trust, which was mentioned over and over and over again. It's the sine qua non uh, for, for progress in this arena. Um, and, and action, uh, obviously, in, in some ways, um, the, uh, these um, 10 words could easily be a checklist or for each of us to use in our various um, settings or with the things that are facing us. Um, from the perspective of the National Academy of Medicine, we obviously um, have to choose carefully about where we can uh, lever our uh, considerable reach. There's no question about that. We do have considerable reach, um, but it's important to have your guidance on how best to do that. So um, uh, we've we had a, a several uh, fundamentally important suggestions in that respect in the course of the meeting. I hope you, you will continue to, um, uh, to give thought uh, to that uh, challenge as you also give thought to the ways in which you and your respective uh, settings uh, can, uh, can and are making a difference and can accelerate those differences. And, and please let us know. We will follow up with a summary uh, of the conversation um, and we'll have um, uh, an initial list of the possibilities that the National Academy of Medicine might take on in particular. Uh, and so uh, I, I want to thank you uh, in advance for uh, whatever suggestions you might be uh, coming to us with. Uh, and thanks, obviously, to each of you for the, the tremendous uh, creativity and dedication you brought to the conversation. Obviously, I want to give thanks uh, to our staff as well. Uh, who really um, have been so superb. Um, both Reed and Jonathan mentioned this uh, earlier, but um, I want to give a, a shout out to, in particular to uh, 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 Ariana Bailey, who was our choreographer today on the front line. Uh, Nora Med, Laura Adams, Elaine Fontaine, Asia Williams, 
uh, Ayadullah, Nishe, the list goes on. Uh, but I, I think that uh, those that I've mentioned were the ones who uh, really were especially working with uh, Reed and, uh, and Jonathan in pulling off the meeting. Uh, obviously, thanks to each of you who were speaking and contributors. Uh, and um, most importantly, uh, frankly, um, let me give uh, thanks again to John Perlin and Reed Tuxen, who are just superb public servants, national leaders, uh, and uh, wonderful uh, chairs of, uh, of this uh, Action Collaborative. So to be continued on all fronts, thanks to all, uh, be well, and be safe.